mute. There you go. Good morning. Okay. And Emily, um, can you introduce yourself so folks know who you are? Yeah, hi, I'm Emily Johnson. I work for the BLM. I'm um, in the aquatics program and um, I've been asked to sit in on the beaver management meetings. So just wanted to make sure everybody knew who Emily is. I think, did I miss anybody? Oh, Derek. Good morning, Derek. You're the last one to well that we're welcoming. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so here we are. So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our audience who is uh, watching our meeting today. This is the Beaver Management Work Group for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we are live. We appreciate you spending time with us today. Uh, our meeting today is a little bit longer. It goes from nine to 12. And we, and we uh, anticipate this is our last Beaver work group meeting. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. A few housekeeping items like we always have. Um, and for anybody who's new joining, um, I'm Jamie Damon with, uh, with Kearns and West. I've been facilitating these meetings and, and uh, joining me is Sam. Sam, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, Sam Mason with Kearns and West. I'm uh, yep, just here supporting the group. Yep, our group members know us well, but for those in our audience, uh, that's who we are. So a couple of um, Zoom meeting tips, same things we've been using all along. Helpful to keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, be on camera as much as you can. It gives us the feeling that we're all in the same room together, um, but we understand that if you need to go dark and take care of something. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, you can text Sam or call her uh, at 360-536-3660, and she will do her best to help. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, this is your where you'll find your Zoom controls. Um, we It's helpful if you can raise your hand, as you know, using the raise hand function. If you can't, we are always um, watching for the actual hand to be raised. So you can certainly do that. Um, we the, the chat is available. We ask that you not use it unless it is you're having some, some issue that you need help with, um, only for, for two reasons, we asked you not use it. One is it's a, it's a sidebar meeting and it's distracting you know, for everybody, just like if you were to have a side conversation. Um, and also all of our viewers can't see anything in the chat. And so it's, uh, um, you know, it's a disservice to them that they can't see what's happening in the chat. So we ask that you not use it unless you need some help. And okay, let's go to the next slide. Meeting guidelines are the same ones we've been using all along. Folks have done a good job of adhering to these. Um, participate in workgroup meetings, come prepared for meetings, participate in an open and mutually respectful way, um, act in good faith, leave baggage at the door, serve as a liaison to your larger community of interest and balance speaking time. Let's go to the next one. So here's our agenda for the day. Um, as I said, this is a little bit longer meeting. It's our, our last one. We have several substantive things to discuss together and we wanted to make sure we had enough time for that. Um, we wanna go through some of the highlights of the feedback from the survey results. And really we've got some areas to focus in on um, to discuss with all of you based on the results. Uh, we want to then, I mean, really the, the bulk of the meeting today is focused on conversation on those few sticking points that we have in the document to try to see how close we can get to agreement on the full report. Um, and so that's the majority of our time. Because it's a three hour meeting, we've built in a little break um, around the you know, 1045 timeframe at the latest, you know, but we'll, we'll see how we're doing around 1030 and if we need a, a short break but we've built one in. And then we've got a breakout room discussion for two items that are 
um, that would be helpful as we move forward. Um, one is key messages to convey to the commission when the report is presented to the commission. Um, and the second question is around um, expectations for implementation. And so, because we haven't really talked a lot about implementation and we, the commissioners thought it would be helpful to have some, some sense from the group of sort of, you know, what your expectations are around implementation. So that's the breakout room discussion. And then we'll come back and we'll hear highlights from the different discussions. Um, Jam, or Sam will do a, a whiteboard to keep track of it. Um, and the, the outcome of that discussion may result in another section of the report. Um, we can decide that together. And uh, then we've reserved 10 minutes at the end for just what's happening next in terms of the time frame and some closing remarks from our commissioners. So that is our agenda. Any questions on the agenda? Not seeing any. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. As always, we've started each meeting reminding everybody of our mission and scope of authority. Um, this is present in the report and uh, you all have done quite a lot of work to vet this. So the mission of the Weaver Work Group is to develop recommendations to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission to consider regarding ODFW policies, practices and programs relating to beaver management on federally managed public lands in Oregon. Policies include the executive order 20-04 on climate action and management includes, but is not limited to trapping and hunting. The scope of authority, the work group will assess current and historical approaches by ODFW for beaver management of federally managed public lands within the agency scope of authority. The work group may include consideration of other local state and federal agencies as well as NGOs, programs and policies and current and relevant best available science as they relate to greater coordination communication and potential partnerships as they develop recommendations for the commission. I usually don't read these two slides, but I thought I would today. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, this is a shared value statement that the group has agreed to months and months ago that really has drived, uh, or driven the, uh, the work that guided, I guess really, is the work that you've done to date. Um, we recognize that beaver inhabited floodplains can have positive benefits for the people, fish and wildlife of Oregon. So just a little recap of where we've been. Next slide. So this is the volume of work. For those of you just uh, who maybe are just joining this work group for the first time, um, view, viewing on the live stream, um, this is the body of work that this group has been through. Uh, we started meeting at the end of June and here we are on April 13th. Uh, you can see down the left side column, all of the topics of the that the group has been through. We've been spending um, most of our time here in the last few months focused on recommendations and refining a draft, the draft report, which will be made available to the public um, after this meeting um, as it's presented to the uh, commission, it'll be posted so folks can see it. Um, the little yellow stars are the subgroup meetings. Your subgroup is uh, Amy, Leland, Chris, and Jefferson. And the little yellow stars show all of the meetings that the subgroup has had as they've taken input from the larger group, refined it, um, and brought things back to you for your consideration. So this is uh, a lot of work that we've been through together. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm gonna pause here um, before I jump into the results of the survey and a couple things. So one is um, I really appreciate everybody's, I mean, basically everybody weighed in on the report, everybody on this call. And so that's really excellent news. Um, we, we got varying degrees of um, input. Some folks went through with a pretty, you know, with, with the red pen and really did a lot of edits and we appreciate that. Other folks read it and said, you know, this is good. We, I can live with what's in here. Um, and we got a lot of things in between. And so we, we appreciate all the time everybody has taken in the couple iterations of the report. Um, we, uh, we've taken all of, the, all of the survey information and we did some follow-ups with some individual folks uh, based on what the, re, you know, what the information came in so we could better understand uh, where folks were coming from, maybe work on some alternative language. Um, and so what we have today is 
we've got, an, there are a number of places. I think there's four, four places, Sam, is that right? Yeah, so there's four kind of substantive sections where, where we have some disagreement in the group. And we've got some, um, what we'll do is we wanna share with you what those are. We want to put on the screen the alternative, you know, the um, the original language in the report, and then we have some alternative language based on some conversations we've had with people. But we really want to hear from all of you, and and the, the point is to see if we can get as close as possible to support for those areas of disagreement. Um, so, and if we can't, we can't, you know. But we, you know, it's worth it to try. We're all here, and um, and if we can't, then whatever, whatever we, the group can't agree on, we'll pull down into the section in the report that says, these are things that we discussed, but we couldn't reach agreement on. And so that, so that's where, so that way the commission can see um, the range of opinions about those topics. So that's the, that's the plan for really the next hour and a half um, is to walk through those, those items. Um, a couple other things I wanna say is, now, I just want to remind everybody that the commission put this work group in place to try to see if this diverse group of people with diverse pers uh, perspectives on what beaver can and can't do on the landscape could come together around a set of recommendations for the commission to consider. And so that's, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to see what this group can come together around. What that means is, is that no one person is going to get everything that they want, because you're trying to build something together as a group. And I know this feels, you know, I'm, I'm saying this just to remind us that, that, um, you know, you that we're really looking for that nexus, that sweet spot where people can say, yeah, you know, I, I can support, I can support that. And, uh, and if you can't, you know, we, we look, we want to hear that as well. And so it's a, you know, it's a product of the collaboration. That's what we're trying to do. And I know that um, over the last couple of months, based on the edits and the proposals that have come forward and the conversations that we've had and the work of the subgroup, you know, folks have tried really hard to come up with language that they think people who think differently from them might be able to support. And so we really appreciate that. So I think that's all the caveats I wanna put out there as before we dive in. Sam, is there anything you wanna share about, you know, that would be helpful for the group before we look at the, this, the four areas? Um, no, I, I think that you touched on everything, Jamie. You know, it's a lot of work went into drafting the language and a lot of work went into reviewing it as we, we saw in the survey and received multiple um, edits too. So really appreciate all of your eyes and, and, uh, and brains working on this <laughs> and trying to find some language that the full group can support. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, the other two things I do want to share is that we have met with your um, commissioner leads a, a two times, I think, since we've met last to just brief them about where we are. We've met with ODFW staff that's here, um, I think two times as well, and to talk about the report and, and gather their input and you know hear their ideas and concerns. Um, we also had a meeting with ODFW staff and our federal partners that are on the call. Um, and that's partly why you see Emily here today. Um, and, uh, and that was a meeting where we worked through um, some real specific things that, um, that our federal partners in the state are looking for in terms of language, in terms of opportunities that they could work more collaboratively together. And you see that uh, reflected in the report as well. So, and then the subgroup met, um, I think three times since we all got together last. So that's, so that just to kind of fill in the gap between when we actually met as a group and where we are now. So that's, and then we've had some individual conversations uh, with people as needed. Any questions before we dive in? All right, let's go ahead and, oh, there is something in the chat. Oh, that's Bob just saying we're on YouTube. All right, review the outcomes of the feedback survey, discuss proposed, yep, I already talked about that. So just a, in a large overview, um, everybody on this call weighed in on the report. Um, Nearly everybody did it through the survey. A couple of folks we had phone calls with or gave us their verbal um, input. So we really appreciate everybody weighing in. 
Um, the, many work group members can support and live with the report at, you know, as it's written. I would say probably about a third of you said that, yep, we know this is heading in the right direction. Um, about two thirds of you said, said, you know what, we've got some concerns, here they are. Um, there were, it, within that two thirds, there were a couple of people that were just like, you know, I, I don't know that I could sign on to this. We're hoping that maybe as we walk through some of the areas of disagreement, we can um, close that gap. Um, so we'll, we'll show those areas that, that we wanna work on. And uh, yeah, and the, we did hear comments from folks that they thought the report was reflective of uh, compromise, you know, within the work group process. And people were appreciative that they could look at the report and see their input. And so that was that was helpful as well. Let's go again and go to the next slide. So, um, so this section six is we're, what, we're, what we're gonna do, and Sam remind me, cause I don't, have all, I don't have all the slides printed out. So what we'll do first Sam is we'll walk through all of the, the, all the recommendations, and then we'll go back to the ones that we need to focus on, right? Yep. That, that's how the slides are organized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so section six, uh, maximizing beaver modified floodplain. These bullets here, these are the, you know, the main bullets. Um, and so you can see the developed priority areas. There were, you know, we received some minor edits, priority area criteria and considerations, minor edits. Management approaches. There's a fair amount. Of, there's a fair amount of disagreement there, and we need to discuss. And so we. That's one one of the four areas. Um, monitor effectiveness. There was minor edits. The periodic review. Uh, there were no edits, and people could live with that. Under program management, there was some disagreement, and we need to discuss a few areas there. That's the second area for us to talk about. To go to the next slide. Um, section six under improvement in data collection and management responsiveness, harvest reporting, there's disagreement there. That's the third area we need to talk about. Beaver monitoring, we re didn't receive many edits, people could live with that. Understanding impacts of trapping closures on the population and ecosystem health, people could live with that. Let's go to the next one. Sec uh, sections six, C, D, and E. Uh, understanding and implementing best management practices through monitoring and researching limiting factors. There are minor edits offered on that. Beaver categorization, there's some disagreement there and we need to discuss, that's the fourth area. And uh, on federal state and collaboration, there were some minor edits there. And that section is the one that really was workshopped with the um, our state and federal partners at a meeting with them. So a lot of, most of the information in that section came from that meeting. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And the last two uh, headings of recommendations, communications and education outreach, there were um, uh, minor edits in there that weren't conflicting. So the four areas that we're gonna go through, if you wanna go back and just so we can summarize, are, go all the way back to the first one. The four areas are management approaches, program management, uh, harvest reporting and be and beaver categorization. So let's go ahead and dive in to the first one. So these were the items under management approaches that there was some disagreement around. And if you know if you have the report in front of you, that would be helpful. You know, so you could look at you know, the report and make notes as we're going along. Um, what we have on the slides is the language that's actually in the report. So we have a slide that says, you know, here's the language. And then we have, um, uh, we have a slide with some, you know, some a proposed alternative, but we wanna have conversation about, where, you know, the, the areas of disagreement. So these are the things that people are concerned about. Um, the defining closures as time limited, there's disagreement with changes to livestock permits or grazing rights. Uh, there's some, uh, some lack of support of harvest closures in general. Um, and there's some lack of support, or there is, there's, there's uh, it's, people, some folks are unsupportive of any trapping on federal lands. Um, there's unsupportive of languages written describing harvest practices in priority areas. 
um, in the introductory sentence. So let's go ahead and look at the next slide, which is the actual language. This is where we need our reading glasses. Okay, so this is the language that we have um, in the report currently. And um, so let's hear what people's concerns are. And, oh, it, thank you, Sam. It's on page 13 of the report. And so what we, what we wanna do, so again, this is our last meeting. And so you know, what we're looking for is if there is a concern that someone has, we're looking for a proposal of some language you know, to put out there of what you, know, what, what you would suggest um, to the group that we do, you know, the group consider differently. So Drenda, I saw your hand up and then you took it down. Yeah, I was just wondering about the page number. Thank you. Oh, okay. So this is the original language. And we had some concerns about, uh, let's see. So bullet, so one, one of the concerns, thank you, Amy. I was just gonna call on Amy. So, um, one of the concerns was around bullet three. The subgroup had actually done a fair amount of work on some different language for bullet three. And, uh, and then through edits that came in, that language was changed. So take a look at bullet three. And then Sam, can you go to the next slide and show the bullet, the language that the subgroup had worked on for that? So this was the language the subgroup had worked on. So the sub bullets don't change, but the heading changed. Assess modifications to the hunting and trapping regulations within priority areas. Amy, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I figured nobody, nobody else was raising their hand, so I'll just jump in here. Um, this was an area that I had concerns on and it was around this, this bullet point um, because we worked for, I think our subgroup meeting was three hours long and we worked through a lot of this um, and got to language that we agreed on. Um, and so it was disheartening to see that there was an edit that actually then came from a subgroup member that changed that uh, to the language that's in the report now. Um, I think that we should stay with the, um, the text that's on the screen now that the subgroup worked through and, and agreed to. Um, I don't agree with the language that is uh, proposed in, in the report. Um, again, it's going back to this, this thought process of we got to close everything and then prove that we can uh, open it. And that's just not something that, that as a subgroup when we work through this section that we agreed upon. Um, I will just note quickly too that I, I had a little bit of an issue with the first uh, sentence just as it was written in the report that we have in front of us. In, um, it's just a little, um, a, a little bit of a ramble. Um, and I think we can just tighten that up. So those were my, my two edits for, for that area. Um, until we get a little bit further down in the other bullet points. Just to stick with you just for a minute. So the, um, the little bit of a ramble sentence, is this, this first sentence here, the, the, the recognizes that ODIP Is it this whole first sentence? Yeah, the, where how it's written and what's on the screen now, I think the the was how it was written previously. Um, and in the report that we got um, in that we have in front of us, not on the screen, but yeah, the yeah. one that got sent to us, that that paragraph or that that giant sentence is different. Um, yeah. and it's it's quite rambly. So I, I prefer the language that's on the screen uh, here in this alternative language. Okay. Yeah. Can you go back, Sam, to show the rambly language? Yeah. So we did tighten that up. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Lauren. Okay. Since we're on this page, I'm going to focus on my first comment. Um, I have uh, huge reservations and cannot support any of the language related to livestock management and grazing regimes. We do not have the cattlemen present here. We have not had in-depth conversations with BLM and grazing permits. And that is just taking a whole group of land managers and taking their way of life and permits that they have um, that they utilize every day. And making a recommendation regarding that and 
putting it in this document um, without consulting them or hearing um, how they utilize that um, or their perspective on that issue um, at all as part of this work group um, and putting that in a recommendation. And I don't think that that is appropriate at this point because um, we've talked a lot about forest land, but we haven't talked about Eastern Oregon pasture lands and um, we haven't talked with the cattlemen about that issue at all. Um, and they're not represented here. And that is a huge group um, of people uh, that we would be affecting their livelihoods at this point. And while yes, some of the cattlemen are my members, uh, that's a whole different um, association and a group of people that I think would need to be represented before we make any recommendations about um, changing um, how they graze and their permits with the BLM here so, and help so, manage that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that, Lauren. And so just, so is your suggestion to remove the second sub bullet that says support the development of livestock management grazing regimes or fencing in order to improve? So is your suggestion to remove that or do you have a suggestion of maybe Yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, I have members that, you know, are members of cattlemen, but we didn't have an in-depth discussion with mm -hmm. cattle producers here and what their grazing permits look like and how they operate on those, those lands, those pasture lands in Eastern Oregon and right. how that would be affected um, or what that development would look like uh, to make that recommendation here today. Yeah. So I, I don't think we could put in language at this point that would be fully informed. Um, yeah, to make no, I hear you. And so I'm wondering about, um, so if we took that language out and I'm just going to work with you here for a minute. I mean, is there language that we can add about the need to coordinate with, with um, those with grazing permits? I mean, is there some, it seems like, you know, what, what, when I hear, when I listen to what you're saying, I get it that, you know, they, they haven't been here. We haven't had this conversation. You know, how can you put a recommendation in here when those folks, you know, we haven't talked with them. And so I'm wondering about putting a recommendation in here about talking with them. Um, and, you know, I mean, well, I couldn't, I couldn't support a recommendation in here today that says to have that discussion with them. I mean, I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable putting in a recommendation today that says have this discussion with them. Um, because we, if we were going to talk about grazing regimes on BLM land, uh, we should have had them as part of this discussion from day one. And we didn't, they're not here. I don't know why they're not here. And we've talked about the cattlemen and both of these be in this and the trapping group. And for some reason they were not included. I don't know and why. So, <laughs> and so, so what I'm asking Lauren is, is there language we can include in the report somewhere that recognizes that, that there are, um, you know, there's, there's a need to engage with the cattlemen on the, on federal land issues. I, I don't know what the language is. Maybe at the end, like, but I don't feel like it should be part of the fully fleshed out report that I would be able to say Farm Bureau is comfortable supporting any language that relates to changing our grazing permits. Yeah. And I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is there's something that we can put in the report somewhere that recognizes that cattlemen have been absent from the conversation and that they need to be included in a conversation if we're going to talk about anything with regard to grazing permits. You, you do, see, do you see what I'm saying? I don't know where it goes, but I'm just, I'm trying to say, is there some way to put your concern that they're not here? And so they're, you know, that whole sector is absent from this discussion that we recognize that in this report somewhere and say, hey, that's something that needs to be addressed. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I do, and maybe at the end, but like I said, I don't feel comfortable including it as part of something that's included in all of this other language that is fully flushed out because it's not a fully flushed out thought. Okay, well, I, 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 think I've, I think I've pressed on you enough. Why don't you could think about that, think about where it might go, you know, kind of look at the report just to acknowledge that they're missing and that you know, they, weren't, they weren't here. Um, so yeah, so think about that. And if there's a place that it makes sense for it to be. And then I'm gonna go ahead and move to Jefferson. I, yeah, um, just to provide a little feedback, that's what not what I was going to talk about, but that bullet point regarding uh, livestock management is merely saying to support the development of 
the idea of how we could manage livestock relative to to beaver. It's ODF and W can't make anybody on federal lands do anything really. That's the federal land managers. So it it would be a discussion, and I <clears throat> I don't think it's I, I think it's a recognition that uh, it it's something that needs to be discussed, and it doesn't say that grazing privileges will be removed at all, or even suggest any direct course of 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 action that would directly Im impair anything. It might improve things. Who knows? But uh, um, I, I worry about objecting to even talking about something. That, that doesn't seem like that's gonna help move any process forward. Um, what I did wanna talk about was that uh, in, in general, actually I'm really fine with going back with the, this previous language um, that, that the subgroup worked on. And Amy, I, uh, I apologize in advance. I, I suggested that other language. That was, that was me in the subgroup that suggested the other language that you object to, and I, and I fully own that. Um, I, but I did it mainly to get a, a discussion going. Uh, and the, the problem I have with this original language still remains uh, that it maintains the status quo of putting the burden of proof or of harm or benefit of beaver harvest at the wrong end of the equation. Um, the language that's in there right now assumes hunting and trapping of beaver should continue everywhere as is until it can be shown that killing beavers interferes with beaver's ability to manage floodplain, at which point regulations may eventually get changed. And the problem is that's the system we're, we're currently in. Harm from beavers has to be proven uh, a harm from harvest has to be proven rather than proving lack of harm from the harvest. And so the language that I was proposing to bring this discussion up puts the burden of proof on showing that a potentially harmful activity, such as hunting and trapping of beavers, can take place in priority areas only after there's sufficient data to show that killing beavers does not interfere with the objectives called for in these recommendations. And the system of first doing no harm to our natural resources, to me, just kind of makes logical sense, uh, but also is ODFNW policy. And it's specifically written and adopted in the climate and ocean change policy to guide commission decisions to err on the side of conservation in situations just like this. And data has been presented to the group that shows trapping and hunting of beavers is very likely to impair beavers' ability to manage floodplains. And examples are given from locations across North America and in Oregon. And I, I, I haven't seen a lot of credible evidence that's been brought forth to the contrary. And so under a first do no harm scenario, does it mean that trapping and hunting are banned? No, it just means that they're paused just in those priority areas as a starting point and paused until we have the information we need to know how or if beaver harvest fits into meeting our goals in that given priority area? Is it within ODFW's ability to start with closures until we are informed and have a plan? Yes, we uh, asked Mr. Blakely um, this question point blank in one of our working group meetings. And he said there was no reason to stop ODFW from doing things this way if they were asked to do so by the commission. And finally, the management objectives agreed to and called for by the working group are much more broad than the single objective that beaver are being managed for currently. Data informing even this single management objective of preventing beaver population depletion is not sufficient and hasn't been for a long time. So it only makes sense to pause potentially harmful activities in those priority areas while ODF and W and collaborators can establish systems to best address and monitor this large suite of objectives. Time is short, the resource problems we're facing are huge we need to take actions now to acknowledge obligations to a much broader range of interest groups who would be the beneficiaries of better beaver management. So that was the thinking behind that. And uh, I understand that the language that I proposed is not uh, going to be uh, adopted by the, the whole group, but I think it's worth getting that thought out there.
thanks for the chance to talk. Thanks, Jefferson. And Sam, can you go to the next slide to show everybody again the, the language there? So it's, it's basically yeah, assess modifications to the hunting and trapping regulations within priority areas, and then all the sub bullets remain the same. Thanks, Jefferson. Leland? So a lot of things have come up since I first raised my hand. Um, from the Wildlife Society's perspective, um, although we would agree that the coordination with cattlemen would be critical, you know, the, the habitat changes from grazing are something that as we're looking at broad management of beaver and beaver modified floodplains, you know, we would be with the caveat that this isn't just, oh, we're gonna change all this stuff right now, right? All of this is in context of, hey, we're suggesting that ODFW look at these options and work through them appropriately. And that appropriately would be working with federal land managers to look at adjustments that would improve beaver management. Um, you know, we would continue to support looking at, at livestock um, grazing. I don't really see a huge issue with that, except for that maybe we could adjust that language to more clearly define that it would require further engagement and a lot more work to talk about, right? Um, this is not just, oh, we're gonna say, you, you know, this should be changed. We're saying they should work to collaborate with those users to figure out a solution where necessary. I think we're looking at management approaches as if it's on its own, but it's in combination with the priority areas. And I think that is something that is getting lost a little bit in this discussion. So as we're assessing modifications to hunting and trapping regulations within priority areas to meet the objectives of that priority area, right? And that can include changing the method, magnitude, location, and season of take. And if the objective of that area is to have as high recruitment into that population as possible and remove any pressures on that population, then that's one of those potential solutions. Um, I think the, and I'm, let me go back a minute. The management approaches alternate, alternative language and original language is a little confusing because to me, this is the original language we're looking at. Um, and the alternative is kind of the, the edits that were made to this. So um, within that, you know, I would consider this the original language with a suggestion for change in the, the new draft. This is much better language to me, maybe with the inclusion of making sure, you know, meeting priority area objectives. Um, so we're more clearly defining that. Uh, I think we're getting a little too prescriptive with that description about what that's going to mean. Um, and we, we have to have some reliance on ODFW and ODFW staff as the managers to figure out how to apply this appropriately. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. So I don't have a, Thanks. So, so Leland, um, before I before I lose you, so two things. The one suggestion you have is in this red bullet of the original language, um, where it says assess modifications to the hunting and trapping regulations within priority areas to meet priority area objectives, including. Are you proposing adding that? Um. It probably it would read better to assess modifications to hunting and trapping regulations to meet objectives within priority areas, including the following. Um, the other thing is I've noticed some of the language in general, management decisions to help achieve the objectives above include, I think, as a general rule, we're suggesting in the language of this recommendation should be a recommendation to consider. So as a general rule, and I think this goes throughout the document, 
it should be can or could include um, for consideration. Just as kind of good policy in, in the language, because we're not, we don't have a prescription here. We can't tell tell ODFW exactly what to do, but we are recommending that these are the considerations. Okay. And then um, one other thing is you had talked a bit about the second bullet that Lauren has concerns with. And it sounds like you were saying that some language around, um, maybe it's not the support the development of with all this detail, maybe it's uh, what, um, engage with permittees to consider, I don't know what the language would be exactly, but, but some, something around you know, acknowledging that, they, that you, they need to engage with them. Yeah, and I think, again, it's not about what we're talking about is meeting objectives, right? So we're not yeah. talking about, oh, we want to change grazing regimes. It's we want to meet the objectives of these priority areas. So how do we do that? So if we're in an area with cattle grazing to meet those objectives, we need to work with the grazing people who are grazing in that area. And again, mm -hmm. I think as a, as a rule for all of us to consider is think about what the objective is. And then that's our goal. Our goal is the objective and the objective isn't necessarily the tools we're using to get there. It's the end, end result. So maybe so, it's engaged with permittees to help meet objectives in priority areas or help address. I'm trying to soften the language, but I recognize, you know, just anyway. Yeah, let, um, I don't have a good set of language there that okay. I think would meet, um, meet the St. Lawrence concerns, yeah. but maybe if sh we can think about this some more and come yeah. back to it, that might be helpful. Okay, yeah, so I'll just, we'll just leave that language there as a, some working language. Just, Darren, did you have something you did about yeah, this one? I know, I just, Danielle, you're in line, but. I'm sorry, it'll just take one second. I do want to mention that uh, um, as BLM, we do have um, permit renewals. And then also uh, we have, during those permit renewals, we have meeting land health assessments. So they have to, um, when they put in for the permit, we have that step also to see if we meet that land health assessment before we um, renew permits and stuff like that. So I just wanted to bring that up. So there are mechanisms to have these conversations. Correct. Yeah, thanks, Darren. All right, Leland, I'm gonna let you go. Danielle, you're up next. Uh, thank you. And yeah, I, I definitely agree with um, Leland and Jefferson to keep some language in there. My, before Leland went, I was thinking of um, just some of the concerns raised by the Farm Bureau and wondering too, if it made sense even to pull this out and put it into section C with understanding and implementing best management practices through monitoring and researching limiting factors, just because that seems to be like that overall assessment of what could be limiting, obviously beavers ability um, to modify, modify floodplain. So I just, I was thinking that could also be a solution as it's going a little bit more in that understanding and and that coordination um, and continuing on the, the research to understand and then eventually implement. Um, so that was just one thought, but that kind of came <laughs> earlier before the others spoke. So I think some of the edits that were suggested are, are fine. Um, I guess my other question, and this is maybe more of a process question or specific to the commission, um, because in reading, you know, some of these objectives, um, you know, for the most part, I feel relatively comfortable with them. I think my my concern is just sort of on the timeline um, and on the actual implementation, because when it says, you know, assess X, consider Y, think about A, you know, whatever B, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand, we wrap up, you know, this obviously would go to the commission. Are they going to put this into rule, you know, and direct ODFW to do this right out the gate. I mean, I just want to make sure, I guess, that there are some sort of timeframes around these things so that it doesn't end up just becoming this thing, you know, uh, without, again, some, some type of time limitation to, to understand it and move towards implementation. Yeah. yeah. And Danielle, I mean, and that's exactly why we have the little breakout 
time on our agenda today is to is to get all of those ex, you know those expectations out about implementation. I mean, so that's what you just said is what we were hoping people would say something like that. It's like, hey, you know, I, I hope that these things will be done first, or I hope that this will be done, you know, in this time frame, or you know, whatever it is that you want to share. So we don't have a good answer yet, but um, yeah. Jamie, I, I think maybe you're misinterpreting that question. It seems more about the legal process of the commission getting recommendations, going back to ODFW to ask for proposals to complete, um, to fulfill the recommendations, and then how that gets into the rulemaking process. And I think that is there is a standard set for that. There's a process in place for that um, that is standardized and has to meet whatever public um, engagement process and all of those. Um, our expect our personal expectations are different, but there is a set process for how the commission takes recommendations, sends them back to ODFW, and yeah. ODFW. Thanks for that comes clarification. Back with proposals. Leland, um, Bob, if I can hold you just for a moment, Shannon, can I? Oh, there you are. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I have kids in the house. Um, so yeah, Leland is correct. We um, we anticipate that we'll have a report go to the commission um, that the public can view independently of this um, forum. And so they, they will get a chance to view that in May um, when the report out happens. And then at some point during that meeting, uh, we anticipate that the commission will direct us to do something with the report. Um, and we talked early on during the um, initial phases of this around what was ODF and W's role. And so it says that in this report that we really were required to take this, these recommendations and analyze them um, and make some recommendations to the commission for action. So I don't have a strong um, date for you or an absolute of when that will happen, um, but I anticipate it'll happen this year that the commission will decide when they want that. Uh, those recommendations to them. And then that will be part of a public process as well. Um, obviously, like any exhibit, we'll, we'll highlight what those actions are. We'll post them to the Secretary of State to notice that it's being considered. You know, some of it might be rulemaking. Um, many of it might just be, this is how we're going to put it in the budget. Um, this is how we're going to collaborate. Those type of recommendations that don't go in rule. So hopefully that helps. But if, if there's more I can clarify, let me know. No, that's helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Bob, for your patience. You're up next. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I guess I'm a bit uncomfortable with what I'm seeing as far as the changes that are taking place. Can we go back to the original for a, sec for a second? <clears throat> sure, Sam, can you go back? There you are. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so so the introductory paragraph, it could be maybe tightened up a bit, but it's got some important points that reemphasizes the fact that we're in a crisis, that, that this, there is science, a lot of science that backs the need for doing what we're doing. Uh, the introductory, the lead off sentence then that, uh, with regard to the objectives could be changed just slightly a bit, say the objectives above could include, just to soften this a bit, um, and we could soften the, the comment regarding livestock grazing from my perspective, because we have specific, we have specific uh, I, uh, recommendations there in a sense. As, I mean, all of those to me are, are fine, but if, if uh, this is of concern to folks, but I still think we should have something regarding coordinating with federal livestock management programs, however we want to face it. So I think that's important. And I think the third bullet's important too, because this is a burden of proof issue. Um, and I really agree with what Jefferson said. He talked about it quite a bit, and I'm not going to reiterate that. So I really think keeping this original verbiage, if I can call it that, the what we've included up here is, is really, to me, more important than uh, the changes that I'm seeing uh, showing up on the, on the next page. So I would just like to voice support for what's in the current draft. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Amy? Yeah, and seeing that I've already spoken once before, I'll, I'll be brief. I don't want to take up a lot of time here. I do agree with um, what Leland said as far as original language and alternative language, um, because I do feel that the the other slide is the original language. Um, and again, I just um, 
you know, there was a lot of work put into that uh, that we we went through in the subgroup um, to get there. Uh, all of the the sub bullet points underneath that bullet um, really identify um, the the pieces that are in that uh, sentence and the ability to change um, and modify, uh, take and harvest uh, in those priority areas. I just want to speak real quickly to you know this the single objective. Um, statement that we we continue to hear and and it, it is in several places throughout the report and I know Jamie and Sam and I've had a conversation about this um, ODFW manages all species to the same the same level the same objectives and the same policy to say that they are managing um, one wildlife species um, with only a single objective is frankly just a fallacy and it's untrue and we're setting the department up to be behind uh, the eight ball, basically, uh, and that's not the 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 place of this report. Uh, this report needs to be speaking to the fact that ODFW is managing beaver uh, the same as they do any other wildlife species with the same objectives, the same implementation of the same policies to include the climate change policy. Um, and here's where this group thinks we can even be more additive to what they are currently doing. Um, we do not need to. Um, in essence, you know, throw shade or slander the department and their management uh, with this single objective uh, sentiment. Um, I, I guess I'll stop there. I don't want to take up too much more time. I'll let others talk. Chris, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, a couple of threads here that I'll try to quickly touch on. Um, I like um, Leland's suggestion of being able to have a sort of a list of such as. And so in the, um, under the first bullet where it's addressed the habitat needs for beaver by working with federal partners too, um, uh, the su yeah, support riparian habitat restoration that has a specific aim of enabling beavers to manage floodplains. And I, I think we could have a list of such as suggestions here you know, such as facilitate restoration and permitting um, and planning uh, for beaver-based restoration. Um, and uh, as Darren said, um, such as engage, uh, this is Darren's point, such as engage with the riparian habitat assessment process to include a beaver-managed floodplain criteria. Um, and then to try to bring the conversation um, with the permittees in, um, the, the, the bullet you have there could be on that list, so um, engage with permittees to help meet objectives. So again, not tying hands, but putting on the table a number of suggested ways to accomplish the support for um, for riparian habitat restoration with um, uh, engaging with beaver on federal lands. So so I, so I I think that I'm not sure if that mm, lowers the um, temperature of the the language by having it in a list and sub bullets, but I think throwing out some ideas is is the, a useful um, contribution that this document can make. Um, yeah, and then Chris, the, can I can I yep. pause you on that just for a minute so we don't let's yep. so I see Lauren's hand up and Ernie I know that you're next, but just for continuity of the conversation. So so Lauren, you've heard a number of people all sort of trying to figure out how to <laughs> how to keep some language in there, and so I'm I, I'm going to with your hand up, I want to, you to weigh in on kind of what Chris is suggesting and what you've heard from others or other thoughts that you have. So we can kind of close the loop a little bit on the, on this, um, this idea. Oh, on the permit? Yeah. Well, on that, I mean, I guess my comment is I appreciate what Darren highlighted, which is part of what I was trying to highlight, which is that we didn't have the in-depth discussion with BLM on grazing rights and what that looks like. And so there are things that we don't know about, like he pointed out, which is there are already mechanisms where when they have renewal of permits, where they're already addressing some of these issues, where they're looking at that. And so um, we don't need to be prescriptive about things that are already happening within BLM and within BLM permits, um, as it were, because they're already looking at those things because they're stewards of the land as well. And so they're looking at those things as part of their duties um, um, as part of their permitting. And so that engagement is important. And I do prefer 
the language of engaging with permittees um, to meet achieved, you know, the desired goals, um, because it's not prescriptive of, um, we're going to do this, um, because I don't also, I also agree that it's not ODF's purview or the ODFW doesn't really have the, the ability to tell BLM how they should. Yeah contract with their permittees anyway. Um, so I believe it is, you know, engaging with permittees, engaging with BLM to have that discussion to meet, the, uh, you know, whatever those outcomes are so they can have that discussion is fine. And I think that that's probably already taking place as it were, because BLM isn't going to just allow their grazing permit, you know, their grazing permits to go do whatever they want willy nilly. That's not the practice today. And it certainly won't be the practice tomorrow. Um, so that is fine there. And then also, I guess I did want to chime in, um, in the discussion with the changes of the assess modifications versus what it was before. Um, I agree with these changes because, you know, the more I think about it, when you look at that, the last, the prior language, um, I don't know what a desired level is. I mean, when you think about it, a, a beaver may never manage the floodplain at a desired human level. So what would be the trigger that would reallow? So I very much prefer being, uh, going to this process that we're talking about here. And so I did wanna chime in um, to say that um, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the language saying, we're gonna close everything until we reach a desired level because a beaver is an animal and is gonna manage and do what they do um, and may never reach what we as humans feel the desired level of their management should be um, because they're, they're going to do what they do. And that may be one thing and it may be another. Um, and so to say that we're going to prescribe whether or not we're going to allow trapping or hunting um, based on um, their behavior and their management of a floodplain, um, I think, uh, isn't... Uh, wouldn't necessarily be the best practice moving forward and that we should be a little bit more prescriptive, prescriptive of what we're looking for there. So that's it. I'm, I'm trying to wait out my clock. Two more chimes. We have one more chime. So thank you, Lauren. I appreciate you weighing in. Um, I appreciate your recognition of that, you know, everyone's trying to figure out how to get some language that um, makes sense and that you're comfortable with. And so I think it sounds like we landed there. So that's good. Um, so Ernie, you are on. And, and actually Ernie, before you, before you speak, so we're at 10 o'clock and we have four areas that we need to talk through. So we've spent about a half hour on this one and we've got three more. So I, I really would like us to kind of wrap up where we are on this and then move to the next, the next topic. Oh, Chris wasn't finished. Yeah, can I just oh, that's uh, really right. quickly? Chris wasn't finished. Yep. Thank you, Leland. I'm sorry. Ernie, hold on. Yeah, just a uh, really quickly. Let's Thank you, Leland. Um, my apologies, Ernie, for, for jumping in. Um, so the third bullet on the assessing the modifications of hunting and trapping regulations, I'm wondering whether we can, again, simplify the rationale back to, as Leland said, what are the objectives? So what are the objectives in the priority areas? The objectives in the priority areas are to try to maximize the benefits from beaver managed modified floodplains and in managing priority areas as priority areas one of the tools is to limit what are potentially impacts to achieving that objective um, and so so human um, land disturbing imp uh, impacts um, and uh, um, vegetation disturbing impacts and wildlife population disturbing impacts. Those are the tools uh, uh, as well as direct interventions like restoration. So in priority areas, independent of um, other, and there's a precedence for this, well, I'll get to in a second, the, uh, independent of other uses of the, of the resources in that priority watershed, if the priority is protection um, and restoration of the right riparian area and using um, um, beaver as that sort of nature-based solution to achieve that, then the toolkit includes um, uh, not having um, uh, take of that animal. The, the, the toolkit includes not having uh, you know, some disturbances in that, in that particular part of the watershed that might come from logging and grazing practices. Um, 
the the toolkit should include um, you know other changes to how that area is managed to so it to meet that objective. And we see that in um, reserves in the for in the forest system. We see that in uh, um, wilderness study areas on the on BLM lands. So that there there are general approved practices um, uh, for um, the multi-use of those lands. And then there are special areas that are designated for needing to meet some other objective. And in meeting that other objective, there's a, an additional set of um, management tools that are applied. And I think what we're asking here, um, and maybe a simpler way to ask that is saying, to have um, closures to hunting and trapping in those areas as one of the tools, not through um, evaluating whether through the hunting and trapping regulations, you know, me, as, as Amy pointed out, trying to par, uh, uh, trying to hit some ideal target, but this is a tool and it can be applied um, uh, in that area to achieve those objectives. And those objectives are uh, meeting. Those objectives are evaluated periodically. I think that we say that in the report. Um, if that watershed has is meeting those performance objectives, then then it sort of it comes out of that status. Um, which is different from some of the uh, reserves and wilderness study areas in the in uh, and wilderness designations in in uh, BLM and, and Forest Service land, which are um, more long-term, if not permanent, designations. So, so, Chris, so this just there... it adds it as a management tool that's separate from hunting and trapping regulations. It's in order to achieve those objectives these things such as the um, our, our potential ways of accomplishing that so what, it, what so I'm, are I'm just trying to separate it from it? from from the discussion of um, how to apply or whether whether the agency is uh, properly applying the current um, hunting and trapping regulation around beaver is just saying if we are going to manage these priority areas for their riparian habitat, their potential to produce all of the other benefits, then here's a list of ways to achieve that. So are you suggesting some change to the third bullet? To, I, I to, think the way it, it's, it's written now is in, in, includes what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to, to trying to help, maybe I'm just confusing. I'm trying to help with the conversation about, um, are we trying to thread some needle to use hunting and trapping regulations to accomplish this um, habitat objective? And I'm saying, can we just maybe set that using the regulations aside and saying, yeah, if we're gonna have this objective in these priority areas, then here are the, here are the potential tools and if it's if appropriate, one of those tools is allowing the pop the beaver population to 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 act undisturbed for a while, in order to accomplish that objective. Mm -hmm. And that's not through the hunting and trapping regulations. That's through the management of the land for its performance objective that we've talked about. Right. So I guess I'm so I'm wondering if what you're talking about is better, it, well, anyway, I, so I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if you're proposing different language or you're just further explaining that the language we have here in, encapsulates what you wanna say. Anyway, I just, I'm a little concerned about time and we've got three right. people. No, I, I, I think, yes, I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to be concise. Um, I think the language as, that's, as written, the modified language um, allows considering performance of the of the of the land as the objective um, and that the, one of the tools is um, changing harvest and so it's not changing harvest through the trapping and yeah so yes I, I think the way it's it's written now is helpful um, in putting the watershed condition first okay all right Ernie, you've been very patient. Thank you, you are on. Thank you. Uh, I would like to refer back to, if you have it in front of you, page 10, where the report states our objectives. 
And the short form of one of these is, quote, maximizing beaver modified floodplain landscapes and ecosystem benefits on federally managed public lands. And it says the focus of this report is on maximizing beaver modified floodplain landscapes on federal lands for the benefits of all Oregonians. I agree with that very strongly. I've agreed with that from the very first day. Now we're into a section of the report that goes from a general objective to we start talking about some action verbs. So when I look at this, this notion of maximizing benefits for all Oregonians doesn't seem to be in here. So I recommend that the first sentence of this section the BMWG recognizes blah, 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 that ODF and W have sufficient justification to take immediate and direct actions to maximize benefits for all Oregonians from beaver modified landscapes and priority areas on federally managed public lands. I strongly endorse that we reflect back to those objectives rather than set them aside. And what's concerning me about much of this discussion is that at least what I've heard, and I don't want to put uh, words in anybody's mouth, but what I've heard is expressing some concern that some groups and some uses might be exempt from that objective of maximizing benefits for all Oregonians. So to jump down to the, sort of down in the, in the middle here, it's the inserted orange, uh, bullet of assessed modifications to the hunting and trapping regulations. The second circular bullet point there is setting bag limits and or allowing for take only where beaver density is high. I disagree with that. It should be only where those who advocate for trapping can demonstrate that the trapping will maximize benefits for all Oregonians. It shouldn't be based on going out and counting beavers. And I, I, I very much agree with the comments from, is it, I, I believe it's Lauren, of we shouldn't be out there expecting that beavers are gonna do this, beavers are gonna do that because we don't have that perfect knowledge. But we do have science that tells us what can we expect, what are the probabilities and that we ought to be making decisions to maximize benefits for all Oregonians. And so if we are somehow going to have language in here that might be interpreted as uh, not consistent with what I heard Jefferson say, I want it to be very clear that that doesn't mean that we are going anti -Jeff what Jefferson was saying. Trappers ought to be held liable for demonstrating that their actions will maximize benefits. Livestock permittees ought to be held responsible for demonstrating that their actions will maximize benefits for all Oregonians. We should not exempt anyone from that general objective. So thank you. Okay, Ernie, so I'm struggling a little bit to figure out where to, what language to put in here to meet your objectives that the group could support. And um, so here's, this, here's, a, here's an idea. So what if, uh, I know you've been really clear about the, oh, their actions to maximize benefits. Let's see. Oh, there, Sam already put it in there. So that's one. So there's in the first paragraph, sufficient justification to take immediate direct actions to maximize benefits for all, or uh, I don't know if it goes right there. You could insert similar language in the first dark bullet point, first circular bullet point, um, or, or even, you know, even in the first uh, dark bullet point, address the habitat needs for beaver. Uh, well, maybe. But for what purpose? For what objective? So address the habitat needs for be for maximizing the benefits all uh, for all Oregonians from beaver by working with federal partners too. Yeah, I, I guess I'm. I don't. 
I guess I'm thinking that, you know, what you're suggesting is kind of an overarching tenet. And so, you know, you could add that language that you're suggesting, you know, in every single thing, but I don't know that everybody would support that, or I don't know that that makes sense. And it's, there's a redundancy there. So I'm wondering about if there's a place earlier up in the document that we could put that as an overarch, because it's more of an overarching statement and it is part of the objectives. Do you see what I'm uh, saying? Uh, well, I do see what you're saying and yeah, and, but it's an important point for me. Critically yeah, important I understand point. that. So, I, yeah. so and, and again, here we are in action verbs. And so what I believe has happened in the past, and we are human beings, the people at ODF and W are human beings. And so there will be, I expect, a tendency to look to this section. Here are the action verbs, and nobody's going to go back three pages and look at what is the objective of maximizing benefits for all Oregonians. So I don't mind if you have something at the beginning of this section that says, here are some steps that uh, we recognize ODF and W has sufficient justification to take immediately and directly toward this goal. And these steps or these direct, these actions ought to be always pointed toward that objective. Otherwise we are going to have, I believe, a tendency for somebody to say, oh, well, we set bag limits and allowed for take because we out, went out and counted beaver and we arbitrarily decided that the density was too high. Yeah. Without yeah, recognizing so, that there may be something else going on out there uh, and, and that setting those bag limits will, will not maximize benefits. Yeah, and again, so, I wanna make it very clear. I've said from the very first, I am not anti-trapping. If the benefits of trapping exceed the cost, kill the damn beaver. But if not, let's not. And yeah, the and benefits ought to be the be the test. And so, Ernie, it's in the objectives. What your language is the very first sentence right. in the objectives. And there's a number of objectives that are. I mean, the purpose of the objective section is those are overarching objectives that all of these recommendations fit underneath. And so, you know, what I worry about is. We, we, that we don't want to take every one of those objectives and take that language and put it in every single recommendation. I mean, those are the umbrella objectives that the that all the recommendations sit underneath. So, so I mean, okay. so help that's, me, other work group members, that's, if I'm that's, missing something. That's fine, Jamie. But then, why do you have a bullet in there that says setting bag limits and/or allowing for take only where beaver density is high? Okay, I mean, that's it. It says all you have to do is go out and count be count beavers in density. But it also says that that's, you know, th these, are, these are different ideas of how to modify the hunting and trapping regulations to meet objectives within priority areas. So one of the, one of the ideas is measure it based on population. Another idea is, you know, to change the season. Another idea is to close the harvest where beavers are translocated. I mean, there's it's a number of there's a number of ways to look at modifying hunting and trapping regulations. That's what all those sub bullets are. So, so Ernie, I mean, we've we've got um, we've got three other areas that we need to talk through, and I, I I really I feel like that what your point is is I mean because it's like the first sentence in the objectives that we've heard you and we put it right there. Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm at a loss for what more to do to address um, your concerns. So maybe, Ernie, if we can pause you and see, I see Leland and Amy have their hands up. Maybe they have some helpful input here. That's a lot to burden on you, Leland, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with Ernie that, you know, we're trying to maximize the benefit for all Oregonians. Of course, all Oregonians does include, you know, ranchers and trappers and all the rest so that's part of the consideration um, and you know trapping is available for all Oregonians so it is that's one of the things that consistently the wildlife society has been trying to say is there may be a small numbers of trappers but that is an opportunity for every Oregonian through scientific management to take advantage of those opportunities um, I, I I'm a little concerned, Ernie, is looking at these, these recommendations or potential methods 
as if these are the only ones. These are suggested suggested options or tools to meet that objective. The you know the objective is what the priority areas are for is to improve that riparian habitat, to provide habitat for these Oregon conservation strategy species, species um, including all the fish species, all these others. So these aren't just, oh, you know, you can choose one of these. This is the tools to meet that goal. Um, not this is the way you're gonna do it. It's the goal is there. We have to meet the goal if you establish one of these priorities area, why was this established? What was the intent of it? We need to go back and monitor that. We got to try to implement tools to meet the objectives of that area. And these are some of those tools that can be used to meet that objective to improve, you know, the beaver dam, beaver modified floodplains and all the rest. Um, but that's why it's so important to have meet objectives within the priority area in that bullet point so that it doesn't get lost as, oh, this is just one of the things we can go count, count beaver densities, because that doesn't necessarily meet the objectives, right? And if we're not meeting the objectives with high densities, we need to figure out why we're not meeting those objectives, or the recommendation is that ODFW needs to figure out why, or the fish, you know, fish division, if they're, you know, taking a lead on something. Um, but again, like I said before, coming back to what the objective of that effort is, and then applying these management tools to meet those objectives is really what we, as for recommendations, should be trying to focus on as much as possible. Thanks, Leland. So I'm needing to move us to another area. So I want to do a, um, sort of a, a straw poll about how people are feeling about the language that we've got on the screen here. I know I heard you know, from a few folks that, that you know, they'd like to see things strengthened a little bit more from the previous language. It does seem like people are kind of coalescing around what we've got on this slide here. Um, so I'd be interested to do a you know, thumbs up, thumbs down from everybody about where we are with this, with, with this section based on the conversation that we've had so far. So we can move on to the next section. Amy, I'll go ahead and call on you. Yeah, just real quick, because it wasn't on the screen um, in either one of these slides, but in, in this section of management approaches, I have uh, an issue with the second to the last bullet in the uh, documentation that came out to us because it was not included in the original documentation. Um, that is that consider closures where trapping and hunting have been found to be limiting factors for dam building behaviors on federal lands. Oh. Um, that was not included in the original edits from the subgroup. Um, and, you know, uh, to my knowledge, and, and I, I, you know, I'm, I think I'm correct in this, uh, there is no such data that exists that shows trapping and hunting have been found to be the limiting factor to dam building behaviors. Um, and so I, I think that is um, a problematic uh, bullet point that got added in there. Um, not to say that you couldn't consider that if you can show that that has been found to be a limiting factor. Um, but again, that goes along with my, my, um, some of my thoughts on how little we have delved into the actual limiting factors of mortality to beavers. Um, so before we jump off of the management approaches section, I wanted to call that bullet point out. And so Amy, you're suggesting to take that, that bullet point out or you suggest, or is there some language to modify that? My preference would be that it would be removed um, if it were to be modified. I think that it needs to be modified um, to change the language from have been found um, to uh, something that's more along the lines of uh, if it were to be found, uh, potentially found, um, because again, I, I don't believe we've seen documentation of uh, trapping and hunting pressures having uh, a limiting factor on dam building behavior. So maybe it's consider closures if trapping and hunting are to be found are to be found as limit as a limiting factor. Because I think part of what we're hoping comes out of this also is a an increase in research and, and data available to the department. Um, and so this is uh, could be rewritten perhaps in more of a forward looking um, aspect uh, for when and if any data is provided that shows that. 
Um, oh, so maybe it could be moved to the data gathering section too. And uh, I, I think it would be better kept in the management approaches mm -hmm. just because it deals with the closures, but I just think it needs to be worded in a way um, that doesn't presuppose that there is already, uh, this is already something that's been found. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Lauren, I saw your hand go up probably in relation to, to this bullet too. Yeah, uh, I, I, the federal, the, the closures on, on federal lands is gonna be something that I am gonna struggle um, supporting at all, um, just as part of our, our policies, just generally speaking at Farm Bureau, uh, we see a lot of value um, in being able to trap on federal lands just for the protection of um, public and private infrastructure. So um, that's just one of those things that I would really struggle um, being able to support just because it's actually written in our Farm Bureau policy book that we don't support closures on federal lands. And so um, there's a lot of places where I can have some flexibility. That is one of the places where I do not. So I just have to be clear with the group that that is where I, one of those places I cannot move. So you're so you're supportive of taking this one out as well. Yes, Leland, what are your thoughts? Uh, it, to me, the the previous bullet, the third bullet point, covers all of this, right? Um, if we're areas. looking at considering yeah. closures, one, we're talking about priority areas. We're talking about priority area objectives, and that third bullet point with all the toolkit there, including potential closures, um, and to meet those objectives. So. I feel like it's redundant uh, um, with the rest of those recommendations. The other piece is that third um, sub bullet for the toolkit. The end part of that sentence seems excessively broad. Um, so closing areas to harvest where beavers are being translocated onto federal land where habitat restoration is occurring, where beaver are either effectively managing floodplains or their gains need to be supported or where beaver are not adequately managing, that's everywhere, right? So that does not, uh, that does not have an objective um, within the priority area. So I'm, I'm a little concerned with how that is, is set up. I, I think that there's value in saying, you know, closing areas to harvest where beavers are being translocated and where habit restoration is actively occurring to meet objectives would make perfect sense. Um, again, getting back to what the objective is and making sure that we're applying these tools to meet those objectives. Um, so those are my two, two points there that delete that consider closures because it's covered in that previous section and then adjusting the language on that third sub bullet point to more clearly define kind of meeting the objectives of translocation and restoration within those priority areas. So just to tighten that up by taking out that the, the everything after where restoration action is occurring? Yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. I, um, we cover the rest of that in these previous sections about changing method, magnitude to take and all that. And it's covered with the meeting objectives portion in, in the main bullet point. Um, so the, that's also redundant within there. Okay, um, Ernie and then Jefferson and then guys, you know, we really need to get to our other three topics. We're coming up on 1030 and uh, we've got a, an hour and a half yeah, thank you, Ready? and I, I appreciate that, but I think these are important issues. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah, just only so much time. Uh, with, with all due respect, I disagree with the change you just made into that third circular bullet point. I think it ought to be left the way that it's stated. And then uh, the, the bullet point that Amy identified, consider closures, I think ought to be rewritten to consider allowing trapping and hunting where they have been found to not be a limiting factor. So again, going back to Jefferson's points, the burden of proof is on actions that might diminish benefits for all Oregonians.
So Sam, did you capture what what Ernie was talking about in that the closures piece? Jefferson, go ahead. Cool, thanks, and I'll, I'll try to be brief, um, but I agree with Ernie that these are important things. Um, just a reminder, we're discussing in this area, basically management actions within priority areas. This isn't talking about everywhere across the, the whole landscape. It's where we're trying to maximize beaver benefits. And so the idea is that as we've discussed, while changing trapping regulations isn't the only lever we can pull, it needs to be an available lever in, uh, in these priority areas. And, and you can pull a lever different ways. You can turn it off, you can turn it on, and there's a lot of stuff in between. And that needs to be on the table um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool. Um, so um, the, the other aspect is that if we only help beaver out where we're planting trees or we're translocating beaver or these very small, small footprint areas, then uh, we're really hamstringing ourselves. This doesn't allow for where we're doing passive restoration or uh, other things like that, or where maybe nothing needs to be done. The only thing that's missing there are, are beaver that aren't being um, uh, bothered. And maybe the only remaining uh, limiting factor is just how we're managing the beaver themselves. So um, where we want to maximize beaver benefits, we have to have the levers available. So keeping the original, uh, the bullet points as written previously, I think it's, is the way to go. Amy, uh, I think um, your point is actually a, a good one and it just depends, are you forward looking back in that original sentence or are you now looking forward to what you'll find looking back? Um, and so uh, if the temporal uh, verbiage there uh, is, is more comfortable and clear for you, I'm, I'm fine with that, but um, to remove a bullet point that says, you know what, if we find out that in this spot, trapping is a limiting factor uh, and therefore we should address it, I, I think that's uh, missing the boat on a lot of things. Thanks. Amy? Yeah, I just think that that's covered in the bullet point ahead of it. We've outlined all those letters that can be used to modify and or close harvest um, in that bullet point with those sub bullet points. Um, so this, the bullet point here um, that's, that's now in orange uh, is, is redundant or restating what we've just said about modifying uh, harvest and all the different levers that may be available uh, to do that. Um, so again, my druthers would be for that um, bullet point to be removed because I feel like we're providing for um, that uh, ability uh, for the department to pull those levers and, and either modify uh, or um, close off trapping and hunting for you know, durations of time uh, in, in order to accomplish those, those objectives. Um, so I just feel like this is redundant. And again, um, yeah, it, you know, it, we want to write it looking more forward, but, it, but again, I think we've just already given uh, a plethora of ways that that can be addressed. Um, a rhetorical question, I guess, because time is, is of the essence, but I, I'm not sure I understand how trapping and hunting of, of beavers or any species negatively impacts all Oregonians. Um, I don't believe that's been shown to be the case. Uh, and so to continue to reference an activity um, and say that it's negatively or has the potential to negatively impact Oregonians without being able to um, really have anything to back that up, I think is just um, not bringing us forward. Okay, thanks, Amy. All right, 1030. So but just my summary of where, what I've heard is that people have made some pitches for some strengthening some language here and refining some language here. Um, 
you know, what Amy just said about if you look at the sub bullets under assess modifications to the hunting and trapping regulations to meet objectives within priority areas, the very first bullet is method, magnitude, location, and season of take. So that's right there is change, you know, is, is understanding, you know, how, why, how much, if, uh, all around take, um, bag limits where densities are high, closing areas for translocated beaver on federal lands or where habitat action is occurring. Um, Leland, you had suggested you these the last part of this bullet go away. We just heard from Jefferson saying, hey, that's important to stay in. Um, you know, I don't know if this is a fall on your sword <laughs> topic, you know, to, to take that out. But it does, it, 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 and then uh, Ernie, you've suggested this, you know, putting this consider allowing trapping in. We've heard from Amy that, and others that they feel like it's really addressed in the, the you know, assessing the hunting and trapping regulations and that it's not necessary to call it out specifically. So that's my summary of where I think we are. I don't know that it's gonna benefit this language anymore for us to um, keep trying to, to, uh, advocate for additional changes. I feel like after an hour, we've really done all we can to try to meet people's concerns. So it seems like we should move on to the next topic, but I am interested to do a thumbs up about where people are at with what's proposed here. It doesn't, doesn't do it for everybody. So just so we can get a sense straw poll. I think you can go down to your reactions. There's no thumb sideways. There should be a, I think, is there a thumb sideways? I don't think so. I think there's a thumb, there's a thumb up and a thumb down and that's all. And there's lots of fun emojis with animals, but, or you could just do it like this. So I'm gonna, if you could all go on the screen, if we, so we, I wanna get closure on this. So thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. If you're just like resigned to this, thumbs up if you support it, thumbs down it's, if it's just like, nope. And we'll just make a note of that. So one, two, three, everybody put your, put your thumbs up. Brian's a thumbs sideways, I think. Danielle, the sideways, Bob's the sideways. Jill is up, Drenda's up, other? Everybody keep your, just go ahead and physically put your thumb up so everybody can see. So a sideways is, you know, we can live with this. Stan, you, you're not supportive of this language at all. Is there any other actual thumbs down that are just not supportive at all? Okay. Stan, there is, there, is there anything we can do to help you support this language here? Well, I think that when you look at the very last bullet point, it uh, says that trapping and hunting can be done sustainably. That means that it's not being sustainably done now. I, I think that we haven't seen that, that ODFW's current programs are not sustainable. So are you suggesting you could live with this if you took sustainably out? I think that the, when I look at uh, changing method, magnitude, location, and season of take, uh, there's just, uh, you know, I go through each bullet point and, and from our, the, the small subset of or Oregonians who are actually uh, involved in the harvest management, um, I just see a lot more problems there than, than solutions. Um, I really do appreciate everybody's insight but you know, I can see where the focus once again is, and that's saying that our current programs are unsustainable. So you know, I, I just, you know, I don't want to go on about it. It's our position's been clear from the beginning that the data has not supported that ODFW's programs are not currently meeting the management objectives under the ORSs or the policies, and I think we just have to stay with that position. So what did, what did Jefferson put in here? 
So Jefferson in the chat wrote, sustainable given the new range of management objectives moving forward, not a judgment of past management. Yeah, Stan, I think people are really working hard to try to figure out how to get language in here that people could you know, live with. That's, that's, where we're, that's where we're at. And you're a big, you know, I mean, we're, we, we wanna to try to address your concern and again, you know, and, this, and, and Stan, this is one section in the whole report. Leland, do you have something to offer? I'm just wondering if it would be better um, from your position, Stan, if it's work with trappers to determine how, how trapping or trappers can assist in meeting objectives of these priority areas or something along those lines. And we're not, again, this is a priority area discussion. It's about meeting specific conservation goals and trappers, of course, will have a role in that as one of the folks who are participating in use of those resources. So would that improve that? Or is it you know, just the whole thing's just, just too much? I really wanna focus on the fact that we're trying to meet these objectives in these priority areas for our Oregon conservation strategy species seems to be, you know, particularly why we're identifying these areas. Um, and beaver is one of those tools to get there. And, and Leland, I appreciate that. And I do think that the addition there does help. However, when we look at priority areas on salmonid recovery, it's basically all fish bearing streams in Oregon. And so what we're saying there is, is that we would be totally closing the harvest opportunities on any stream that's having any active management. Well, we're managing supposedly either through direct management or indirect every stream now. And so, you know, that's our concern is, is the way I think this is so broadly written that when we start talk, talk about scope and scale, it's everywhere. Yeah, and I think we need to differentiate between a beaver management priority area and salmon management priority areas, because those things are not gonna be the same, right? Like you said, those salmon management areas are gonna be much broader, but if we're talking about prioritizing management for beer modified floodplains to meet these objectives, it's not going to be across that entire watershed. There's gonna be smaller areas that are gonna be prioritized through a variety of factors, including meeting object, you know, the habitat requirements for dam building from beaver um, and the monitoring that's required for that and all those pieces. So again, this is not, I don't think this is as broad as that interpretation. And maybe that's something we need to make more clear in the priority area designation section. I would agree with that. And, and I think those discussions and modifications, and I know Jamie, we're taking a lot of time on this, but really this is, you know, from my user group of Oregonians, this is a, a priority section. And because uh, these are the limitations that could affect mm -hmm. us and our abilities to recreate. And uh, so, you know, I could probably switch to a, to a neutral, which, uh, on this, but I, I still have grave concerns about the dialogue that I've heard today and uh, the lack of science supporting the removal of this recreational harvest opportunity for Oregonians. And uh, I think that we, you know, we have to be inclusive of all Oregonians. And uh, so I think that this is an opportunity, I mean, I refer to how many falconers do we have in Oregon, for example. And, uh, you know, it is a small subset of users, but it's an important subset, especially if we're using the word all. So I don't want to, you know, take any more time on this. Uh, um, I think it's real clear that from our constituency that we're concerned about, you know, when I look at assess changing the methods, we, we, we have had no discussion about that in this work group, how we change methods and magnitude is actually what we're talking about in magnitude you're talking about bag limit 
you know, magnitude and bag limits are, are going to be this, this, the same. In other words, your magnitude of harvest is going to be set by, uh, you know, how you restrict the amount of harvest. Now, location, that's back to where we go on, on where this is done at. And season, uh, you know, we've had no discussion in this work group about this season. We, we, we know when their breeding season is, we know when their, you know, territorial seasons are, at least from our harvester's perspective. But um, so, you know, I could go with each bullet point, but I don't want to mm -hmm. take any more time. And I think our position's been relatively clear. I do appreciate everybody's input. Uh, Leland, go ahead and then let's, I have a proposal. I mean, just for everybody, I think we, we have to remember what Shannon was talking about when Danielle asked that question about process. This is not the final decision coming out of ODFW. This is a recommendation to ODFW to investigate and assess the viability of these different options. And I think we could agree that, you know, in some of these priority areas, if it's a really critical spot, that reviewing some of these options is worth looking at, right? And that's what this recommendation is for everybody. Hey, we've got concerns. We need, we need ODFW and the professionals to look at that and make sure that we're, we're addressing these. And mostly we're, we're looking at kind of adapting a little bit about where our focus is in management. But I hear, I hear Stan's concerns and I've heard Ernie's concerns. I hear everyone's concerns. I just want to, all of us to be really clear on, on what we're actually looking at here, what the outcome of this is, is this is not the change. This is a recommendation for them to pursue, to investigate and go from there. Yeah, thank you for that, Leland. And thanks, Dan, for being so, you know, frank. I mean, everybody really just being really clear about putting out there, you know, what your comfort level is, what your concerns are, what you'd like to see. I mean, all of this, I mean, it, you know, this meeting is being recorded. We're doing the best we can to come up with some language that, you know, this group can say, you know, we've, we've basically gone as far as we can go as this collection of people. Um, and this is the best we can put forward at, you know, at this time. And so I think, um, you know, if Stan, if you're, if you're neutral or a thumb sideways, then I, I think we had the majority of people as a, okay, you know, we can live with this. Let's move on to the next topic. Um, so what I, what I propose, we've been at this now, you know, since nine, I think we should take a five minute break to clear our head. I think we probably should not do the small group breakout because we really need the time to go through our, we have three more areas to go through. Um, and uh, we have an hour and, and 15 minutes or about an hour and 10 minutes, you know, once we take our five minute break. So let's take five minutes, take a stretch, get some fresh air, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, and then we'll come back and we'll tackle the next one.
All right. That's our five minutes. It just flew by, but it is amazing what a just a five minute break can do to help us focus and and um, even though it feels like you can never take the time when you're running out of time, sometimes it's just the exact right thing to do. So let's go ahead and everybody come back. I see people are coming back. And thanks for everybody's hard work in that last hour and a half. That was uh, that was some of the you know I mean just really rich discussion. People being really thoughtful. I appreciate everyone trying so hard to come up with language that could meet other people's concerns, but also being really clear about what your boundaries are. So and and you know ultimately when this is presented to the commission, I mean those um, you know kind of the the pushing the limits of where people could go. I mean, that, that needs to be part of the presentation that's put forward. You know, that in many ways, the report represents, you know, the nexus in the middle of a Venn diagram of, okay, these are the things that we think we could live with, but that doesn't mean that the other pieces of that Venn diagram that are important to each of you, it doesn't mean that those go away. Um, and I think that that's, you know, we're not, we're not saying let go of those. What we're saying is where is some place that you could come together around? And the report is trying to uh, be that space in the middle. And so, um, you know, certainly it's within everybody's, uh, you know, right to share with the commission, you know, the, the other aspects of the Venn diagram that are, that are important to you. So next topic. And again, you know, these four topics, the reason why they're tough is because this is where we have some disagreements. So these are going to be hard conversations. What's our next topic, Sam? It is the program management. I'll pull it up on screen here. Thank you. Okay, these were the two, these were the two uh, areas that there was some disagreement around and um, so did we, we heard some comments of folks who were not supportive of additional funding for ODFW and we heard some from folks that said that, oh my gosh, we need to talk more about funding because how are we gonna implement these things? So this is um, on page 14 and then Sam, do we have, Current, uh, current language and proposed language for this one too. Yeah, this is the original language. Oh, reading glasses again. And do we have proposed language for this one? I don't think we do, do we? No. No. So who would like to start in terms of weighing in on what their concern is around increased funding and or um, some way that we can modify this language on the one side. And on the other side, we heard from folks that were saying there's not enough discussion about funding. And so if you've got a proposal, so we need to, we need to come together around what we're saying here. So who would like to start? Lauren, thank you for jumping in. I guess I'll start with one part of my issue with this is I'm not exactly sure how the, and I guess this is part of the, the back end discussion of how the report is being used and how it'll be used with the names of the groups that participated in this process, because obviously OFB has our own funding priorities and um, we have issues um, that uh, have not been funded in the past that are other priorities like predator management um, uh, that just aren't getting funded at the levels that we would that we would prioritize over the habitat division. And so um, more pressures of other divisions in ODFW having increased funding is not really something that we would want someone saying, oh, this group recommends higher funding for this division and Farm Bureau is a part of that. That's not really something that we would want to be included in because we have other priorities of where we would like to see different divisions of ODF or different priority areas of 
uh, or ODFW and different priority areas of where funding goes, especially as we see natural resource funding. We all know this natural resources funding at, at the legislative level um, is a very small amount of funding that is always constantly being cut. And so we just have concerns about uh, what the priorities are for our legislature of where that funding goes. And, and so it, it, my concerns about that were more on the back end of how this report is being used. Um, at the legislative level for lobbying for small amounts of natural resources funding, we obviously have other priority areas of where we would like to see funding go um, in the long run. So um, it's not anything that's going to keep us of, of this report. This is not the big thing that's going to keep the sticking point for us, but I just wanted to highlight that we have other uh, natural resources funding priorities in the Habitat Division at ODFW. That's all. Yeah, Lauren, that's really helpful uh, to understand because we didn't understand <laughs> where that was coming from because it seemed like everybody had been talking about recognizing that it's like, yes, in order to you know, move forward on these things, we're going to need more resources. So we yeah, were so all we of our were just, we were just like, what? You know, all yeah, our natural resources needs more funding. So that was the yeah. point I was trying to make. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, and I hear what you're saying about that. It's like, you know, if, if an organization you've been, you know, and other, other folks on this call, call probably are in a similar boat, you know, that they're advocating for different priorities. How does this suddenly sort of, you know, does it slide over the top or you know, kind of, you know, how does this fit within all the priorities that people are advocating for? So that's, that's what I hear. So based on that, is there, you know, is there something that you would, um, so two, two things, is there language that needs to be modified to address your concern? I'm not, number one, and or number two, do we leave the language here, but then as your organization, just like I just said about, you know, everybody can put their you know, comments forward, that you, that your organization would put forward comments to say, we support additional funding, but these are still our priority areas. Um, no, I mean, I don't think I would, I don't think I have any language changes for this, but I think that I would have comments and in, in how the report is used later. I think that, okay. that is where my comments will lie. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Leland, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I hope other people will jump in. You know, as the Wildlife Society, one of our concerns is the amount of pressure on the biologists um, that would be required to implement a lot of this. Um, and of course, if there's no funding support, then they're just not going to be able to do much. Um, and so, one one of our questions or or concerns is: Are there places we can identify funding that, like, um, one of the first things that comes to mind is maybe Oregon Conservation and Recreation Strategy. Their role is to provide funding to implement Oregon, Oregon Conservation Strategy projects and if we're talking about these being generally beneficial and particularly the priority is priority areas benefiting or in conservation strategy species is that something we can call out as a focal point um, for from the management perspective that you know or in conservation and recreation fund may be one of the funding mechanisms for this I just Unfunded mandates uh, are a problem. Um, I don't think this rises to the point of being a mandate, of course. It hasn't gotten, you know, this doesn't have any authority. Um, but if we actually want to see some of this implemented, we're, we're going to have to talk about how to make that happen. Um, and it, there may be some recommendations here that we can make that would help. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Shannon, can I lean on you for just a moment? Because we, when we met with staff last week, that this was one of the concerns that came up, which is around managing expectations around implementation and where you know where the money's going to come from, and um, and so you know we just talked about that as a concern. I don't know. Actually, Shannon, I don't know what you would say more than what I just, more than what I just said, but I do want to invite you to say anything about that um, if, if there's something more to add. Sure, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, it was uh, really nice to hear Laura's response because um, I think it 
help kind of set the stage for, you know, there is a lot of asks in here that require funding um, being available to accomplish them and especially at the accomplish them at the level that it's being requested. Um, and so really it is, as she very adequately described, it is this strategy of what is really a priority, and I'm not talking about priorities for Beaver, but priorities for the state as far as funding around research. And there's already in the document, it clearly states, you know, this not being a T&E species, there's funding limitations there already, um, but there are methods um, in looking at Beaver and prioritizing it through organ conservation and strategy and other things that can make it higher in the priority realm. But it is still, and it's clarified well, a lobbying game um, of trying to get funded. And um, Leland's consideration of OCRF is, is a really good one. Um, but um, prior to this 2022 session, you know, the, the cap has been $50,000 on those grants. So that, that's a good amount of money. Um, but it's not going to get you really far on these recommendations. Um, you, you need several grants and, and you'd have to find a lot of match money for these projects. Um, and that's just back of the napkin. Look at this. So it works similar with federal funding opportunities. Um, and then what other very few state funding there is this really, these are really about, you know, selling these as projects. Um, whether you're in the state forum or you're in the federal forum um, and what's going to take priority um, as we move forward implementing. And to your point, Jamie, and why I really appreciate you gave me this time is, you know, there are a lot of expectations around this work group's effort. I mean, it's been an eight month effort, I think you said. Um, a lot of work has gone into making these recommendations. Folks don't want to see this just shelved and, and no action implemented on the ground. So we're cognizant of that. I, I just we wanted to recognize that there is a lot of funding requirements to implement those recommendations. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Um, Jefferson? Thanks, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to think back to the various, the, the various conversations that went on to kind of inform this part of the statement. And I, I think the intention was just to reflect and acknowledge the fact that to do, to implement <laughs> even a, a portion of these recommendations was a big lift and a big ask of, of ODFW that's already kind of overtaxed. And so it just reflects, again, our acknowledgement or the Beaver Working Group's acknowledgement that to do these things is gonna require money and not telling them how to do it, uh, allowing for creative thinking and that sort of thing. But I think if this wasn't in here, for example, people would then object and say, well, how are they supposed to do this without any sort of money? Did you ever think of that? So it's, it's more to cover that, that base and, and be clear. Yes, we know this is a lot. Thank you, Jefferson. Danielle, your hand was up, but then it's down. Did Jefferson say what you wanted to say? Yeah, uh, yeah, and and Leland too. I just the OCRF. I think to Shannon's point has had some limitations, but it's also you know there's now specific beaver mitigation money. There's uh, you know a lot of the projects actually that have been funded by the OCRF are beaver focused. So I there's probably a lot of potential there. I guess is what I wanted to underscore. Okay, so it doesn't sound like there's any proposal to change this language, and it seems oh. like we we better. Oh, go ahead, Leland. Uh I, well, just thinking about what um, Jefferson just said, maybe that is the change is rather than saying we recommend, it's that we recognize the need for increased capacity to support doing all this. We, you know, we, we recognize that this would require expanding ODFW capacity, all of these pieces um, rather than, you know, and that might address Lauren's concerns as well, right? Is that, you know, we're recognizing the need for this we're not necessarily saying that all the members are going to prioritize this, um, but those re these recommendations are going to require, you know, those changes. Thank you, Leland. I like that. I, I appreciate that change. I would appreciate that change. And Jamie, if I can jump in real quick, I do yeah. think, uh, you know, as we've kind of been talking about managed expectations as well, um, we do need to acknowledge the fact that we are already into the budget cycle, you know, for the department. Um, for the next uh, fiscal year that, you know, 23 to 25. And so there is going to be a lag 
um, in, in getting um, any of this, you know, capacity increase. Uh, we have to, you know, understand the, the cycles that we are in as far as budget and legislative cycle. And so um, I think the recognizing the need piece that Leland just brought up is, is really good. And just, you know, for, for the entire group to understand kind of how those timelines run and be able to manage those expectations of when that capacity may be uh, able to be increased. Yeah, so good clarification, Amy. All right, anybody else want to weigh in on on this before? It sounds like we've we're good. Do we do a? Are we ready to do a thumbs up, thumb sideways, thumbs down poll? Chris, you have a hand up. Jefferson's ready to go. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I recognize the need for um, uh, recognizing the things that that we can't control. Um, but you know we have no power at all as this group. We're just making recommendations, and so we recognize the need. Um, so how to how to make it seem like it is a issue of high priority, high concern that somebody else has to take up, right? And so by saying we recommend it, we're saying we, I feel like it's we are kind of recommend recognizing the need already. Um, but if we just recognize the need, that's not saying at all who should act. Or so maybe recognize the need and recognize that it's that it's a, a, a that it needs to be a priority. Um, I I I don't know how to convey the, the managing of expectations and the uh, the bounds on what we what you know what we have authority to do. But if we are not making recommendations for actions, that allows no actions to happen. So, um, so what do you suggest? You know, I'm going to ask. ask that. I know. I knew you were going <laughs> to ask me that. Um, I mean, you've got. So, if if I can, there are there. Yeah, I guess I would. I throw it to. I, I would. Curious what Leland, um, uh, um, maybe Lauren would think too about how do we, how do we recognize the need and how do we encourage action? I mean, I think this is throughout the entire document, right? Um, where we, we are making these recommendations, and we'd like to see something happen, and so how how to within the bounds of what we have the authority to do, what kind of language can we um, used throughout that recognizes the need for something to happen. Otherwise, you know, we would we wouldn't have gotten we wouldn't have language that's pushing on our comfort level um, well, at all. I think to answer your question, I would say that with the recommendations we've made throughout the document, ODFW will then incorporate that into whatever pops or programs that they already have going on. And at this point, they've already developed their pops for the next legislative session. So like, as Amy pointed out, I think we're a little bit past the boat for the next legislative session uh, for now. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think as Leland pointed out by putting recognizing the need, I think that, the, that this is us uh, saying, we wouldn't be surprised if as part of all of our programmatic recommendations, so the thing, the actions that we're recommending they take, we wouldn't be surprised if there was a pop that was related to that later on. Um, and I think that this takes the burden off of me as uh, you know, if I, if I do eventually sign off on this, this, this group, this uh, report to support that pop. Um, I think if this were to say, you know, we recommend the increased capacity and in farm bureau's name as a part of this report, then there's, there's an inherent support of that as a priority thing that I would support that as a budget item, but maybe in natural resources based on, you know, my group's large involvement in multiple other natural resource agencies, maybe my natural resource priority would be something related, you know, for water resources. And maybe that's where I want to put my lobbying uh, weight in the next legislative session. And I wouldn't want my lobbying weight perhaps used on a beaver recommendation that session. So this sort of takes that away. Um, the pressure off of me to support maybe that pop, but that doesn't mean that I don't recognize the need for it. 
I mean, it's very nuancy. I yeah. get, I get that, but um, it's all part of that. As Shannon pointed out, that lobbying game when we're in the legislative session with natural resources, because there is just such a small pool of funds that our legislators devote to natural resources, unfortunately, um, and we're always playing that that game of where do we want to really push on them um, for our individual groups on natural resources that session. Um, unfortunately, that's where we end up being. We, where we end up every session. And so I think that that sort of takes that away without without saying that we don't recognize why ODFW is going to ask for it. Okay, thanks for that, Lauren. So we've got three hands up and, um, and then we'll see where we are after, after Amy, Shannon and Leland. So because we have two more areas to talk about before we're done at noon. Amy, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a, a potential wording uh, you know, structure to throw out here, um, uh, kind of in what Lauren's saying and, you know, along the lines of what, what we've all said. And I know that there are several groups, you know, that have been working to find, you know, alternative funding for ODFW and, and, you know, working, uh, in that vein and, and every budget cycle, we're, you know, kind of trying to work to help ODFW, um, get more, uh, finances and capacity. So, you know, just for, for, to see what the group thinks of this, um, the BMWG recommends continued investment in increased capacity, resources, and infrastructure within ODFW, particularly in relation to the recommendations contained within this report. Um, we're, we're recognizing the need for overall capacity in that sense, but then we're also tying it back to the recommendations within this report as well and the carrying out of those recommendations. So um, just throwing that out there to see if that helps. I need to uh, either put that in the chat, Amy, sure. so that Sam gets the actual language that we can stick on the screen. I don't know if Sam, you were able to capture that. Sort of, kind of. Yeah, I'll try. Okay. Um, while Sam's doing that, uh, let's hear from Shannon. Yeah, I'll just be real quick. Um, well, first, apologies to Lauren for pronouncing your name wrong. Um, but yeah, again, with what she said, uh, I just wanted to clarify, we um, as an agency put draft pops together, but we're right in the middle of our public process phase. So we have town hall sessions going all, e all evenings this week. Um, and then in May, we have a commission meeting to talk about that draft recommended budget, including the policy option packages to add new programs. So, you know, this group and, and other public, we want to hear from folks about what's on the pop list, what should be there, what should not be there, what should be refined. So there is still an opportunity to get, you know, a request to the legislature for funding for this. And since we may have public watching who aren't familiar with these processes, that means tax money through general fund would come for this. ODF and W as an agency only receives 10% of its budget as general funds. So as has been adequately explained, that is a bunch of these groups lobbying to get that money put into our budget um, to expand upon what we can do with federal funding and license dollars. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for that clarification. So there's still time for folks to uh, advocate for increased funding in this budget cycle. Leland? Let's hear from you and then let's take a look at this proposed language and we'll do a straw poll. We know where Jefferson is on the straw poll because he's already, <laughs> he already, he already did. Leland, go ahead. Uh, I, I think that language is, is better and I was gonna come up with some additional language, um, but I think Amy's is maybe better. Um, I might be uh, a little more proactive and recommends continued investment to increase capacity, resources, and infrastructure within ODFW, in particular to implement these rec blah, 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 blah. The one other thing I may suggest is, you know, we recognize the need for expanding ODFW staff capacity and encourage ODFW to collaborate with variety of partners to, you know, accomplish, you know, to increase that. Um, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought with that topic to increase. Um, so maybe work collaborate with a variety of partners to, you know, 
in, increase funding and beaver related coordination or um because really what we've, we've been focused on a little bit is this how much this is going to require from agency staff and probably need new agency staff to help with it and maybe that covers all the bases including getting into ocrf stuff a little bit um and i'll, I'll stop there i think okay I've killed a lot of time on this already all right any last comments before I call for a straw poll? Shannon, your hand is still up. You're done. Would it help to say encourage ODFW to collaborate with a variety of partners to identify and increase, was, identify funding sources and or something like that to say yeah. we need the identification and then also the expansion? Yeah, I was thinking that same thing, Danielle. I'm glad you said that. All right, straw poll, thumbs up, full support, a thumbs sideways, I could live with it, thumbs down, nope. And if you have your thumbs down, I will call on you and ask why. Keep your hands up so everybody can see. Let's do a look around. Okay, we've got a couple sideways. Scott's not sure. <laughs> He's landed sideways. I was like, where are you going, Scott? Uh, Drenda, where are you at? Brian, thumbs up. Okay. Uh, who am I missing? Bob, I didn't see. Oh, you got a thumb up. Stan, where are you at? Oh, you, uh, that's a thumb up. Okay. Wayne, how about you? Was it a thumbs up, Wayne, or a sideways? I can't yeah, I hear you. His, I think his thumb is close to the camera. I think oh, okay. Yeah. Pull your, oh, there it is. <laughs> I'll say, pull your thumb up. Okay, good. I think we're good on this then. I don't see any thumbs down. Thank you, everybody, for working on that language. All right, Sam, what's next? Harvest reporting. Okay. All right, so let's look at the language. So my understanding is that their con concerns were raised. And so Stan, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'd like to start with you, Stan, actually, if, if it's okay, you want to collect your thoughts. <clears throat> so my understanding is that there's concerns about what's being, you know, what's being proposed in terms of additional reporting um, on the, you know, for the trapper's side. And then there's also a concern about, um, any additional reporting requirements that might happen on the private side. And so I, and I, and so I think that that was another issue that was raised. So people who had those concerns uh, speak up so we can see how we can modify language. So Stan, um, did, I, did I accurately reflect what I think your, the concern is? I think so. I, you know, we, this is our proposal for him. You know, OTA has been, been proposing this from the onset of, of the work group that one of the concerns was that our data collection was inadequate to actually have population analysis and, and opportunities associated to those, you know, that, that data set. And so we thought that possibly we could strengthen that data set by having an enhanced reporting uh mechanism and so you know you're, you're going through these bullet points and the date the beaver was taken obviously we we have report cards already for river otter and bobcat and and uh, sturgeon and and uh, salmon steelhead and so this is just taking off of that mechanism reporting data collection mechanism so there are things that we could do i think that would easily assist in some population dynamics. And so, um, you know, indicating habitat type, uh, you know, habitat type, now if you, that would be an interesting thing. So what are you actually talking about there? Now you're getting to the point where you're, you're going to have uh, an individual trapper say, well, this is a certain type of habitat. Uh, you know, I think that that would be probably too fine a scale. However, if you're looking at stream basin, 
um, and, and area in that basin, if those were broke into certain areas, um, you know, that could be possibilities. But all in all, we're supportive of, of increased data collection, uh, as long as there's not an increased cost and uh, associated to individuals for that data collection. And so that would be, you know, kind of where we're at on it. Stan, so you don't have any, do you have any proposed language changes in, in here that could help? Or is you know, I, you... I, I would leave that up to our, our, our managers, our biologists to, who actually would say, okay, this is what we need in that data collection. This is what would be most beneficial. I think I would leave that up to our scientists. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure that there would be input with with the per people who would have to be you know supplying that data but um, that's where i would leave that what i would have you know that recommendation would be left up to the, our biologists to to uh, you know build the record card the need of the card yeah okay so and then i know um lauren i'm gonna pick on you again for a moment, because I think that your your concern was this one, two, three, four, fifth bullet down where it says land ownership, and there it is, private lands. Right uh, yeah, there. I wouldn't want any uh, changes to reporting for predatory animal takings, um, recommendations to ODA to change how any sort of taking of predatory animals, which would include beavers on private lands. Um, our farmers have enough that they're doing every day. And if they're taking of beavers um, as a predatory animal, it's because they're causing damage on their property and they uh, have a, a lot that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, any additional requirements and reporting requirements that they have to deal with um, is just more red tape and bureaucracy that they're another thing that they have to add to um, what they're dealing with outside of, you know, the actual job of farming um and i just i don't want to add to their burden so um and and lauren is thinking is it fair to say too that um that you know if there were to be any changes to reporting requirements on private land due to damage that that would be something that we would need to work with uh, oda around as well is that yeah uh, and we have not included oda in any of these discussions at this yeah. moment so um yes so any recommendations um for increased uh reporting for that i mean and then that also goes to the classification so i mean it, it's just this really That's nuanced the next topic. discussion yes so um when we look at increasing the the reporting harvest reporting of beavers we have to be very specific about what we're looking at and if that's just the harvest um, of beavers outside of them as a predatory animal on private lands, then that's a different discussion that um, is for the trappers and not for me. So, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Jefferson, go ahead. There we go. Um, yeah, concede that uh, we are only making recommendations for public lands um, as useful and informative as it would be to know what's going on on the huge proportion of private lands in the state where there's potentially uh, a lot of beaver. While that would be super useful information to have and would really inform beaver management in a productive way, we have crossed private lands out of, out of the discussion. However, if there is a reporting card or an online thing that trappers fill out to discuss where they trap their beaver, if in addition to the various state forest service bureau of management, there was a box that provided them the opportunity to say, I wanna inform beaver management in an extra way, I got this one on private lands, then, um, that is not a requirement, it is an opportunity and it would provide uh, a, a, lot more, a lot more information. So I think if I remember uh, the conversations we had about this kind of um, a thing, I, I think that's where it was going if I remember accurately. 
Okay, thanks Jefferson for telling us how you really feel. <laughs> Amy? Yeah, I do just wanna point out real quick that not, not all trapping on private lands is under the, the damage heading. Um, and so uh, there is uh, fur bearer trapping that does happen on private lands. And, and um, I, I point that out kind of in the context of this conversation, but also in reference to on page nine, I know I'm jumping, Jamie, forgive me for this, but this ties directly to the three bullet points on page nine, um, where the second bullet point at the end says that it's based only on data collected on public land, and that's not the case. So all fur bearer uh, take is reported, whether that is private land or public land, it's just when it's the predatory animal uh, designation doing damage on private land that we have a, kind of that separate designation. And so I just want to make sure and point that out because I would really like to see that uh, second bullet point on page nine uh, corrected as well. Thanks for that, Amy. And we did get that from you, and, um, but it's good to make that connection here in the meeting today. Leland? I mean, I think, I think I agree with what everyone said here so far. Fur bearer take requires reporting no matter where it is. So private lands make sense. Maybe it's worth including a bullet saying voluntary reporting of damage take or something like that. Because it sounded like in the presentations from Derek or others that some of these damage folks who are doing damage take are reporting anyway, um, just to, to share that information. So just making sure that we're really clear that we're not trying to change any requirements. We're just provide it's about providing pathways for data to come into the department for use and removing that. Obviously, damage take is governed by ODA. That's a completely different discussion. But someone doing damage can choose to report um, voluntarily. Derek, can you clarify what um, Leland was saying about reporting? Reporting specific to damage take? No, about um, uh, Leland was saying that there is there there is an opportunity right, right now. There is some reporting on private land for damage take. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. And there is um, there so is and is there reporting by fur bearers? You know for. For recreational trapping on private land, is that reported? Yes, all of that is. And there are times where licensed fur takers are trapping beaver for damage and they're reporting that on their record card, on their harvest report. Okay. In addition yes. to wildlife control operators oftentimes report things, wildlife services previously would report things. So we get a lot of information on private land. So one of the clarifications is this doesn't actually say anything about fur bearer take in this harvest reporting. And maybe that's something we could fix that would solve a lot of these questions. Yeah, I was gonna suggest that maybe we just add suggested fur bearer reporting changes. So just add fur bearer before. Oh, I see. And that would, that would make my members feel more comfortable and me a whole lot more comfortable if we just added fur bearer right before reporting after suggested fur bearer, just right before reporting. So suggested mm -hmm. fur bearer reporting changes. And that would that would clear up the predatory animal issue for reporting. Okay. And that would also include the for the 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 trappers that come onto private lands, even you know, that are reporting it on their their fur bearer licenses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. All right, anybody have any other last words about this to clarify or strengthen or weigh in on before we do a straw poll? Just wanted to weigh in, that Lauren. Good catch. Okay, not seeing any other hands. Welcome, Becky. I see that you joined us, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde. Okay, do a straw poll. Same thing. Um, just hold your hold your hand up on the screen. You can use the emoji, and uh, let's go around and see where people are at. Thumbs up, full support. Thumbs sideways, can live with it. Thumbs down, not 
supportive and I will call on you. It looks like mostly thumbs up. Okay, I think we're good to go. All right, last category or the last topic is beaver categorization. Um, so there were, and, and um, again, I think I'm gonna call on Lauren to start, but before you start, let me just give a little bit of background. So uh, the group has been exploring, you know, as a work group, you've explored different kinds of categorization of beaver. Um, we had considerable discussion about this with our federal partners and ODFW around what the range, you know, what the options are that are meaningful to federal partners, particularly that could potentially open up uh, funding streams. And so that's where that's where this has come, that's where this has come from. So let's go ahead and look at the language and uh, see what if we, there we are. We, Sam, we, do, we don't have proposed language for this either, do we? We do. Um, oh, we do? Just a, just a guess. Just a Okay, so proposal. we'll keep that in our back pocket for now. So, um, so this is the language that was in the report that was sent out. And we did talk about, you know, the need, you know, that, that a special designation of some kind could help to leverage funding. It's meaningful to different partners. It opens up, you know, different grant opportunities, et cetera. So this is, this is what's in there currently. Okay, Lauren, have I given you enough time? I continue to struggle this one with this one. And I know that I, I can't be the only group. And I know that it's gotta be on both sides. Um, uh, both me with being really uncomfortable with any change in the categorization of beavers and with other groups not feeling that the suggestions are strong enough. Um, and we've done so much work on the rest of this. I really feel that this may be one of those things that we need to stick at the end with the no recommendation, because the more I think about this, I, I continue to be uncomfortable um, for a variety of reasons. Um, with, with touching the categorization of beavers, um, with a, as land managers attaching beavers to any sort of categorization that would have to do with any sort of ESA or as helping with endangered species or anything. Um, our land managers struggle with that every day. I, I just, I don't think that there's, that I just really struggle getting there. And I don't want to, I don't want to put this group in the position where the whole thing gets blown up over it. Um, I understand the reasonings why for funding purposes, that there are, there are reasons why you would want to find ways to recategorize the beaver. Um, but it's just, I, I continue to trip over um, uh, ways to do that um, that would not make it difficult for any land manager. So that is where I am. <laughs> yeah, and um, I appreciate that, Lauren. And so let me just push on you just for a, a tiny bit, and then I'm going to give a chance for Danielle um, to speak. So you know, so we've you know we've tried to put language in here that is around the exploring. Um, you know, that, that exploring language and that, and, and, uh, and part of that, you know, is, so if you look at like the last sentence, um, you know, when the conservation strategy is opened up for, you know, or revisited and when, when ODFW is looking at whatever designation might make sense, I mean, there's a process associated with that. And so, you know, there's a number of places in here where there's opportunities for different organizations to weigh in and say, you know, no, or yes, or stop or whatever. Um, and so this is this, this language here is just basically is recognizing that there's an opportunity to look at a different designation for beaver in these other processes. So anyway, I don't know if that helps. Well, no, I mean, I appreciate that we would have that opportunity, but I mean, even looking at this, I mean, if you list a beaver modified flood floodplain as a strategy habitat, anytime a beaver goes in and 
starts building a home and modifies a floodplain, now it's a strategy habitat. And now my land manager is having to fight a butt up against that. So that's where my land managers really struggle is that anytime a beaver comes in, I mean, cause a beaver is going to go build where the beaver wants to build and they're not going to have a recognition of it's a private land, federal land, county land, state lands. Um, and now it's got this strategy habitat designation tied to it. So, you know, the, the, the struggle for the land managers is, is now I have to deal with the strategy habitat from this, this listing and from this animal, it's not, you know, that's that they have to manage or they have to struggle with. And so I just, I, I understand that first there's some, and again, I get it. I, there are some members of the group that are on the complete opposite side of me that feel like, you know, we should be going completely the other way. And so that's why I just feel like this is one of those things we did not get to fully flush out. Maybe we could have fully flushed it out if we sat in a room and really hashed it out, but we did not. We didn't have the full discussion. And I just don't think that this is something that we're going to come to an agreement on or something that that I can get to a place where I'm comfortable or that even if you could get me to a place where I was comfortable that I would, you know, that that place would be a place Danielle was comfortable with. I don't think that that's a fair expectation because I'm really going to be risk averse to any reclassification of the beaver versus where the animal groups would want to go at this point, I think. Okay, well, let's pause you and let's hear from Danielle. Um, thank you. And yeah, I just, I guess in hearing some of your feedback, I'm, you know, we know that this is for federally managed public land. So it sounded like a lot of the reference you made was about what it would do on private land. So I, you know, I don't know if this specific recommendation can stay within the frame of what the overall recommendation is, which is for federally managed public lands. Um, Cause that is what we've been tasked with. Um, you know, my perspective, and I, this is maybe a question to a lawyer or ODFW or the commission, which is, you know, even when I think about recategorization or reclassification, you know, I'm not even necessarily thinking of removing the, the status of it being a fur bear, but I guess I'm wondering why we couldn't have sort of multiple layers of classification, if that makes sense. You know, it remains a fur bear, but at the same time, it's a conservation strategy species or, um, you know, a keystone, like what if we are creating a new category for keystone species to understand their how this interconnects with the rest of the Oregon conservation strategy. So I guess my thinking was not so much this like fully going to the legislature and changing the classification, but rather is there a way within the Oregon conservation strategy that we can highlight the importance of the species and quite frankly, other keystone species. And, you know, it beaver, beaver modified floodplains do exist in other strategy habitats and in other strategy species profiles. So all it is is teasing this out to say, this is a priority as it relates, you know, to all of these things that are part of the OCS. So yeah, I agree. I think it needs more consideration, but I, I, I guess, again, maybe this is more of a, a statute or classification question. Can, you know, can you, can it exist to have almost multiple classifications? Um, so before we hear from, we've got Amy, Drenda, Leland, Jefferson, before we hear from all of them, um, Shannon, is there, do you know the answer or, or maybe one of our federal partners to what Danielle just said about can something, can a species have multiple classifications or multiple categories? Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify, I mean, it's a great dialogue that there is statutory definition of species, which is where predatory animals and game animals come from. Um, there's also, you know, our descriptions of sensitive species that are in rule. Then there's the federal government's TNE designation. And then the Oregon Conservation Strategy and strategy species are a bit different, although they are in rule. The Oregon Conservation Strategy was really built um, as a requirement to have a state action plan and to designate certain habitat and certain species as being kind of focal species. And so that you can have an animal on, you know, statutory, statutorily defined as well as defined in rule as well as a strategy species. So I think that answers the questions, but I'm also, 
you want us to step in deeper into what it means to be an Oregon conservation strategy species or that that we do have uh, wetlands on the list and beaver modified wetlands on the strategy habitats, uh, Kevin or Derek, not Derek, Kevin would be good if you want that. I don't know if you have the time for a larger conversation, I'd kick it over to Kevin, but I think I answered the question for now. Yeah, we don't have time for a larger conversation, but <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Um, Danielle, were you done? Can I move on to Amy? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, Amy, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think this conversation maybe highlights um, what what I was going to bring up, and that is we we haven't delved into maybe all the puts and takes around what each one of these different um, uh, categorizations would mean, um, and especially within the context of public public versus private land. Um, and I do notice that in this section, uh, we don't have the words recommend. We have the words identify. Um, and, and clearly it does say that we, the group did not discuss the possibility in greater detail. So I think my suggestion, uh, because of all that, and it sounds like maybe we're all on the same, same page as far as, I think we would need a lot more in-depth, um, and robust conversation to know kind of where we wanted to proceed, if we wanted to proceed with any of these designations, um, would be to maybe move this section to, to the end, because it's not a recommendation. We're, we've identified it, we had a conversation around it, whether this goes in the we don't agree section or it stays in its own section, but is popped to the end of, of all these other sections that have recommendations, actual recommendations, it just might be a little bit easier, you know, as you go through it and the language is different. Clearly, this is not something that we, you know, discussed and or, you know, came to agreement on. I don't know that it necessarily means that it needs to go in the disagreement section or that where we didn't reach agreement but we just didn't vet it enough. And so I think the language that you've used in here with identified uh, instead of recommends perhaps means that we could just maybe move this to the last section um, and maybe make that a little bit more clear in, in the language that it's not a recommendation, but this was a conversation that we began within the, within the work group. Yeah, that, I appreciate that, Amy. And the last section is actually called additional Additional issues raised without recommendations from the Beaver Management Work Group, and so that so this would this could fit there. That yeah, like you said, it's not so much that it's disagreement; it's more that it's like you know we really didn't explore this in great detail. We understand there might be potential, but there's also a lot that we haven't you know we haven't discussed. And I think we could use a whole work group, you know, one of these work group sessions just to discuss just this. And clearly, we don't have that kind of time. Everybody's just gonna sign up for that, Amy. <laughs> Starting next week, no. Go ahead, Lee. Are you done, are you done Amy? Drenda, what's up? Thank you. Well, I was thinking along the lines of what Amy was saying, but I'm wondering about uh, if there is a recommendation here, I think it would be that this uh, issue be explored. I would take out, I would end it at, uh, the last sentence of the first paragraph and take out the within the Oregon <clears throat> conservation strategy and the bullet lists. So I would either move it with just that first paragraph or leave it there with that first paragraph, but the recommendation being that this uh, receive uh, further exploration. But take out the specifics of what ODFW should do. So we've got two proposals on the table. Um, Drenda's, which is to modify the first, uh, modify the modify this to read as a recommendation, but only include the first sentence. Um, we also talked about including federal. So the BM, the Beaver Management Worker have identified that a special designation of beaver on federal land. Um, and, and then the other suggestion is to just move this to things that we identified, but don't have a recommendation around. Okay, Leland. Yeah, I'll be quick, hopefully. Um, I'm not sure I agree with the idea of taking those bullet points out. Those bullet points are actually what make me more likely to support this because I really would struggle with the idea of beaver being listed as a conservation strategy species. Um, 
but I'm much more likely to be supportive of saying it's a data gap species or that BUR modified floodplains could be a strategy habitat. Um, because again, it's looking at objective, right? What's our objective? Objective is, is not to have, you know, you know, beaver be recovered. They're, you know, what we're looking at is how to use the beaver as a tool to help with all these other aspects. Um, so just kind of the other piece is, you know, there was some discussion about regulatory impact of being listed as an Oregon conservation strategy species. And my understanding is that Oregon conservation strategy is not a regulatory document, right? So it's not associated with regulatory change. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I think the Oregon conservation strategy is so valuable is that it allows this discussion without necessarily the high input of a, a regulatory burden on top of everything. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we brought that up and maybe, you know, ODFW folks could correct me if I'm off base on that. Shannon, you want to weigh in on that? On Leland's? Yeah, no, I, I thought that was very well stated. It, it's not meant to be a regulatory document. It's meant to, you know, prioritize habitats and species um, for funding and action to, to support them. It, it, we do have, like I said, in rule, we have sensitive species lists uh, and other things that really kind of more have that protective look, but the state strategy is not meant to do that. Okay, Leland, were you done? Yeah, I think so. Okay, Jefferson. I think uh, Leland, once again, is making a, a really good point. And um, with now Shannon's backup there, uh, I would remove the on federal lands um, because if it is not the strategy, uh, conservation strategy is about creating opportunities, not obligations, then it, uh, I think it would then uh, address Lauren's concerns about, oh, what if a beaver comes on and has uh, modified floodplains on, on private lands? Well, then if they want to then get funding to help out that beaver, then that helps them out, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't create obligations on that landowner's part mm -hmm. then. So um, on federal lands, I think the more we bisect and reduce and make things more complicated in terms of where is beaver what, it's already pretty complicated. So um, I, I, I think that should suffice. Um, but just in general about kind of keeping consistency throughout the document, um, I, I, I feel as though if we are mandated to maximize uh, beaver benefits of managing floodplains, um, it, it's kind of like how, how could we put forth and honestly say we are working towards the things in this recommendation that these things are truly important, that we want to get funding, that we want to focus effort and action on these things and not have beaver floodplains or beaver as part of the conservation strategy. If, if they're not part of the strategy, it's, it's kind of a, it kind of seems like a little empty, bit of a promise there. If, uh, if it's part of the conservation strategy, it kind of solidifies that commitment and provides ways, just as we were talking about earlier in that funding part, for moving funding to, to, to support uh, beaver managing fund planes. It, it provides the impetus for encouraging action to achieve these things. So in, in my mind, if we're not recommending it to be part of the conservation strategy, we're, we're kind of saying yes, but not, not really. So I, I think it really helps reflect our commitment. And, uh, and I, I think it does rise to the top of, of being a recommendation to look at how beavers should be more explicitly, uh, beaver managed floodplains should be more explicitly part of the, the conservation strategy. So I'd, I'd leave it as is, and I think we've had a lot of good informative talk. Right, but we have four more hands up, Jefferson, so Chris? 
Um, yeah, thank you. I think the points of the people before me are, are good, and I generally agree that this should stay where it is. Uh, it's not it's not strongly worded as a recommendation. It's identifying um, uh, that this was talked about, that there's potential there. It sends a signal through a, as a Shannon pointed out, and um, a not a statutory binding um, status. Uh, much like the Sagegrass Initiative, it's you know underlies a public partner, public private partnership to to accomplish um, conservation goals, without needing to bring you know bringing sort of heavy-handed um, statutory designations, either state or federal. Um, so if the if the goal is to accomplish habitat. Um, representation in, across the state for a wider benefit. This is one way of signaling that. This is a set of tools that allow these collaboration and education goals that we have in this document to be accomplished. So I think it's it's in the right place and it's of the right tone um, as it is. Okay, thanks, Chris. Lauren? Um, so just two quick things. One, because it doesn't have a recommendation in it, I do support um, the suggestion that we move it to section seven, which is you know the section where it's additional issue race without recommendation, because there is not a specific recommendation in it. But um, I would be comfortable moving it there as written be, um, because it does focus on the, the habitats as opposed to the beaver specifically. Um, and then also, I guess, from my perspective and um, for, for those of you on the call who don't uh, work in the building, I, I guess, I, I just want to be clear that this doesn't just stay um, at ODFW. We'll see this document again. It'll be used for our legislators. It'll be used in policy development. So I think that um, I don't want it to seem that I'm, um, I, I'm not trying to be a pain by saying, you know, these are the things that I'm concerned about and here's why. I'm concerned about it because We'll see this document again in other policy venues. It, 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 all of this work is put in, and yes, it's for recommendations to ODF and W, but this is a document that will be put in front of our policymakers for other reasons as they develop other policies. It'll be said, oh, you know, the Beaver Work Group recommended X, Y, Z, so you guys should do that in this arena too. And so that's why, I, you know, when I bring up these concerns is because I, I, I do believe that I'll see these again. And so I, I have these concerns for what I think are valid reasons. And that's why I wanna make sure that we're being very strategic about where things are and how they're worded because it's not just going to be recommendations to our commission and how ODFW handles it. I think that it's gonna be something we will see again in other policy areas. So that is why I have concerns and why I wanna make sure that we're being very thoughtful about where things and are and how they're written. So I just wanna be clear about that. Yeah, so Lauren, um, what, so what I'm hearing from you is that you're, Sam, can you go back to the other language that's in the report, the previous slide there? So Sam, what, or Lauren, what I'm hearing from you is that, that you know, you're fine with all of this language here if it appears in the additional things, in, in the additional items under, uh, what, what did I call that title? The raised without recommendation. Yeah, yeah, because I don't think that we have a recommendation from the group. I think a consensus, a consensus recommendation from the group at this time on this issue. And then you've heard a number of people say, you know, maybe we could modify it to make it a recommendation to explore, but that you're saying that that's a no-go for you as well? I think that this, I mean, what does that mean? And how does that work? That those are longer conversations. I mean, even you said yourself when Shannon said, oh, we could have them talk about it. That's a longer conversation. We don't have time for, we have five minutes. Um, yeah, and I think that if we, wanna, if we wanna do it to the justice and the conversation that it's deserved, um, then we need more time. And so I think at this point it belongs in the without recommendation. Okay, D Danielle and Amy, and then we, as Lauren pointed out, we do have five minutes and we do need to do a recap of just kind of what, what to expect next. Danielle? Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, our perspective is that this definitely needs to stay in where it is and that um, it's okay that it's a recommendation that 
further exploration happens, but I do, I think it's important that it stays as a priority because especially as we've heard from some of the commissioners and some of the direction they're hoping to take the agency and how we think about this work and how they look at this is not exactly species by species, but looking at larger landscapes and sort of the, again, this interconnectedness of all species in the ecosystem. I think this is a very important step to moving in that direction and helping give the action plan and the direction for the agency to continue to do so. So I do think it's really important and um, just wanted to underscore that. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Amy? Yeah, I don't know that I, I um, have a, a hard time with leaving it here as long as the language stays in, you know, identified as as opposed to recommends. My concern is this, we just, I mean, as we've seen, we've not fully vetted this. There, there are prerequisites or, or um, you know, preset requirements for each one of these categorizations and, and, you know, beaver don't always meet those. And so what would be the appropriate, uh, you know, place to put that in? And, and as we've said, that's a, that's a big conversation. I'm not saying that we don't, you know, acknowledge that we've raised this topic and then it definitely does need more conversation, but I don't think we can say that it's a recommendation because we just haven't vetted it um, fully. And we don't even know, honestly, if it, which one of these classifications would have the desired outcome that, that folks are wanting, right? As far as funding and things like that, um, because we just haven't had the, the information brought to us about what these different structures and, and identifiers mean and what they would then leverage for us funding wise or attention wise from our agency partners. So um, I, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other as far as leaving it here or putting it in the non-recommendation, as long as if we leave it here, the language stays the same uh, as far as we've identified this uh, and, and surfaced the topic, but there is no recommendation at this time uh, or a, a substantial recommendation other than we should, it should be explored in more depth. Um, and Jamie, I know you're going to hate this and I apologize, but because I, you gave me the mic and I know we only have three minutes left here, um, I do want to call out one thing that I think is super important. And this goes all the way back to page four in the document. And I, I just need to surface this real quick because there was a change made under uh, section C, work uh, group mission and scope of authority in that document. Um, and I am, I am having heartburn over it because it's talking about how the work group um, made the decision about whether this was going to be federally managed or not. And again, I know I brought this up before, that was not a work group decision. We had discussions on it, but that was not a work group decision. The commission gave us their, their parameters for this work group and the sideboards in both the June meeting of 2020, the August meeting of 2020, and then again in the November meeting of 2020. And I think it's really important that this document acknowledges uh, the commission's role in setting the sidebars um, and the scope, as opposed to the work group's decision. Uh, the yeah. commission set that, the commission needs to take ownership of that. And I think this document needs to reflect that. Yeah, and I don't hate you. That, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it is a clarification. It's so if folks are looking at, it's, um, it's under the work group scope and authority. It's on page four. Um, there's some language there. So it was my language, basically acknowledging the, uh, the uh, conversation that the work group has had about the scope. Uh, but Amy's right. I mean, the direction came from the commission about what the scope uh, was. Brian? Yeah, I mean, just really quick, you know, I mean, I think if you look at those commission objectives that, you know, there's places where it's broader and places where it's narrower and that it was, the document should reflect that there was discussion about this and, and how we landed. And I, I think the way it's worded now totally accurately describes uh, what occurred. Um, but I also want to flag that I, you know, I thought I raised in my survey response some other serious reservations that don't seem to have um, gotten into the discussion. And I, I don't, I don't know if my survey response came through or, or what, including including a reservation about how the limiting factors are described in that uh, section of the recommendations. And I don't, I don't want to try to get into it with, with two minutes left, or I guess no time left, but um, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, thank you for that, Brian. And so um, 
I'm sure that I thought, I'm sure we did get your survey responses. We were what we were trying to do when we got everybody's in, information back in areas where there were um, you know multiple areas of disagreement that we needed to focus this conversation. That's where that's what we did. But we can we'll, we'll follow up with you, Brian, on that because I don't. I, I honestly I can't recall what it what it was. Yeah, that, that's that's fine. Thanks. Um, so we need to figure out where we're landing on this uh, beaver categoriz categorization. So Lauren has said now twice that she feels strongly that it should get moved. We've heard from a number of other people about, and this is my clock, sorry, um, that it should stay, you know, where it is. Ah. My clock is telling us that we should be done. Um, and, uh, and that the language here so one, one thing I could offer is it says the Beaver Management Work Group identified, um, you know, maybe it's identified the need to explore uh, additional designations of beaver that could help to leverage funding. I mean, if we added some language like that, that keeps it here, it's still, it, it softens it a little bit, but it keeps it here. I mean, it really recognizes that everything that you've all said that it's like, hey, there's more conversation and work that we need to do here. Leland, what do you, what do you think? I, just, I mean, the beaver categorization is a broad thing, right? So maybe just changing this to not be beaver categorization, but Oregon conservation strategy or review beaver's place within the Oregon conservation strategy would help with that because beaver categorization brings in all those other statutory policy problems that come along with that. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about Oregon conservation strategy um, and that being a non-binding, non non-regulatory process. That's a good catch, Leland. What do you think about that, Lauren? That's better. And so then I would also need, you'd probably want to change how you, this first sentence reads. It would be need to explore you wouldn't say designations, you would say yeah. something else the that role. relates directly to the Oregon conservation strategy. The role of beaver within the Oregon, beaver and beaver habitats within the Oregon conservation uh, strategy. Does that help keep it here? I mean, yeah, I, there's still no real recommendation there. So no, <laughs> which is fine by me because we didn't come up with one, but I mean, it still fits at the end because there's no recommendation, but if everyone yeah. feels strongly that it should remain before that, there's no recommendation. So I'm fine with it. Okay. And I Great. prefer that we took the categorization out. So thank yeah, you. That was a, that was a good catch, Leland. Um, all right, so let's do a thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down on this. And then um, if I can, uh, I, I do want to let you know what's happening next. So it'll probably be like five minutes. And I do want to give the commissioners just a chance to say like 30 seconds of something before we close since it's our last meeting. So everybody get your thumbs ready and keep them up sideways or down. Let's see where you are on this new language and keeping it where it's at. Brian sideways, Amy's up, Drenda sideways, stands up, Wayne's up, Darren sideways, Ernie sideways, Bob sideways. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I'm seeing that that, okay, good. So what this does now, let me talk about what hap what's happening next. Do we have a slide, Sam, for what's happening next? Or was I just going to talk about it? How about you talk about it? Okay, let's just talk about it. So what's happening next is, um, so we thank you so much for working through this language today. We've got, there are some minor edits that have, when I say minor, it means that, um, you know, one person or two people made some things that don't dramatically change what the language is, but we're like, hey, we'd like to see this or we'd like to see that. And so uh, we'll do a little bit of follow-up. So Brian, maybe that's where that fell in. So we'll do a little bit of follow-up with people on that. We're gonna take 
uh, all the information that we received and we're gonna turn around another draft report and we're gonna send it to all of you to look at um, the, before it goes, you know, it, as a part of the commission, you know, for one last look through, we don't have any more meetings scheduled. Um, this is our last meeting. And it's, the report is scheduled to be presented to the commission at their May meeting. It's May 13th. May 13th, thank you. Um, and it's, a, the, as Shannon mentioned that meet, or maybe she didn't mention here, but the meeting is focused on, well, she did mention it here. The meeting is focused on budget. Um, and, but so this is an additional item. And we, and the commission is really interested in having um, Sam and I together with the subgroup present the report to the commissioners. Then we gave the subgroup a heads up about that and they put it on their calendar. And so what the presentation, what we thought we might do if we had time today was to do breakout groups to hear kind of key messages, but you can certainly send us those, um, you know, you know in, in an email about, you know, kind of what you're, um, actually, I'm just sort of speaking, I'm kind of thinking and speaking out loud here, you know, maybe what, because we always do a follow up after this, Sam, what do you think about, we could do just a little survey and people could share kind of key messages in that with us. Um, Cause I think that would help us and the subgroup in the presentation to make sure that, you know, we're accurately reflecting. I mean, the report says everything, but you know, if there are some key messages you want to elevate. So that's uh, one thing. And then the other part is, um, oh, the timing of when the report is made public for all of you watching. Um, and so it will, so we'll turn around a draft. We'll do that pretty quick. We will, you all get a chance to look at it before it gets sent to the commission. And that's like a fatal flaw review. And I believe we have to get it to the commission uh, like May 2nd or uh, April 29th, right in there. Um, and then that report would be posted on the ODFW website for the public to see. So that's the immediate next steps. Amy? Yeah, just really quickly, I wanted to throw out, and I won't speak for the rest of the subgroup members on this, but if there are folks who um, feel strongly that they'd like to have a conversation about presentation stuff by the subgroup um, or wanting to get their, their additional points uh, across or anything like that, um, I'm very comfortable with you giving, you know, with my contact information being uh, out there and, you know, kind of an open door. If, if folks want to discuss that with me, I'm, I'm more than open to that um, and always um, open to further conversation around it. Yeah, thanks for that, Amy. And it reminds me that we probably, and Jefferson says me too, um, it reminds me that we'll, that the subgroup uh, and Sam and I probably will find some time to put our heads together for you know, like a half hour or something um, prior to the, to our presentation at the commission, just to lay out what we're what we're going to say and do Leland uh, yeah I mean I'd, I'd agree that you know we should have those conversations I guess my concern is that um, as Brian mentioned he had some sections that he had concerns with there's probably sections that other people had concerns with that didn't get talked about today and there's going to be changes and what happens if we do hit a barrier where there's changes that folks mm -hmm. really can't accept. Um, you know, I know that this entire introduction section, you know, we had a number of sections where we would like to see at least some minor changes mm -hmm. and some occasional places where we thought there were fairly big sections that should be changed. Um, and I'm a little worried about what what that means for the acceptance by the full group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. It is tough that, you know, this is our last meeting and we're trying to get this over the finish line. Um, and, you know, I, th I think the, the time that we spent today was really the, those were the, those were the big issues. Those were the, those were the issues that in Sam and my assessment were like deal breakers. If we couldn't, if the group couldn't coalesce around them. Um, and so I think what we just need to do is work with individual members to work on the remaining edits. 
Um, and, you know, I, I guess I would be surprised if this group doesn't have a good sense of sort of what other group members would support at this point. Um, and Sam and I can be a good meter for that as well. So we are, we're just going to do our best um, to try to incorporate the edits and make sure that it finds that sweet spot and then send it out to the group for a fatal flaw review. Um, yeah, that's about all I can offer. So um, we are about 10 minutes over. I know that we're, we are standing between all of you and lunch. I do want to give um, Commissioner Hatfield Hyde, Commissioner Zarnowitz and Chair Wall, just, I mean, 30 seconds to say something because this is your last meeting. You guys have done a tremendous amount of work. I think back to where we were last, you know, June and May in our individual conversations and where we are today. And, um, and even just evidenced by how you work together today to try to meet each other's needs. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of, of uh, coming together around some difficult issues. It's not all done. We're, in many ways, this report launches more work um, as opposed to ending anything. Um, and so, you know, I, so I don't know who wants to go first. Um, Jill, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, this has been very impressive work group and, uh, and the document you came up with, um, I think will have a lot of support on the commission, at least, you know, I can't speak for, for everybody, but I certainly find a lot of good things in it. And I know it's going to be um, a challenge to get the funding for, for all of it. Um, but I, I do believe that that, that can, there's money coming in potentially from the uh, Restore America's Wildlife uh, Act uh, if that gets passed, which it sounds like it has major support. And then there's also the conservation strategy, um, con the Oregon Conservation Restoration. And anyway, that <laughs> OCRS. And, um, and that there's, there's opportunities there, there's opportunities in um, a lot of other places. And that's where um, I think that we can move forward on this and get a lot of good information on beavers and how, um, how they're interacting and how uh, we, can, we can restore some of the habitats on federal lands in particular. And I, I also do wanna say that the um, listing them or their habitat as a strategy, say a strategy habitat. We have had oak habitats as uh, strategy habitat for years, and that doesn't prevent private landowners from clear cutting them. That's happened in my neighborhood a couple times. It what it allows is money to go to people who want to restore them, you know, take out the Doug firs or the Hawthorne or something like that and restore them to what they were more traditionally when the, the Indians were burning the, um, the grasslands. So it's, I, I'm glad you were able to keep it in this document uh, because it's not regulatory at all. It is simply a, a means for landowners, whether it's state, um, possibly federal or private to, to get money to, um, to improve those habitats. So um, anyway, that's what I have to say. I'm, I'm just really impressed with everything that everybody's put together and um, it's been a lot of work. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jill. Uh, Becky, anything you want to add? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep, you're coming through. Oh, good. good. Thank you. I'm I'm uh, in a remote setting, so um, I uh, mostly I just want to express my gratitude to this group of people that represents a real diverse uh, selection of Oregonians who care deeply about um, taking care of. Uh, of this state that we get to call home. Um, I think I feel especially emotional today because I was not able uh, to attend the early part of this meeting because I'm down here in Klamath uh, trying to keep our communities held together uh, and, and focused on 
a future uh, of how we take care of of this place. Um, these small acts of uh, of uh, respect towards one another um, yield those results on the land for for the for the for the beaver for the people for the communities and so um i'm i'm very thankful i'm very thankful for the hours of work that went in here and uh i'm hopeful that some of the relationships that have been made in this setting will carry over to other settings that that um frankly have become too toxic in oregon and we need to to get back to 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 uh to knowing each other. And so that especially has been impressive given the fabulous Zoom environment that we have all lived on here <laughs> for a couple of years. So I look forward to the presentation of the sub, the subgroup is gonna give to the commission. Um, I, 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 I'm just, I feel grateful. So thank you, thank you all. And I'm sorry I wasn't on here earlier. Thank you, Becky. Mary? What would you like yeah. to add, Chair Wall? Thank you. I'll be real quick um, and save the point, most of the, what I wanted to say for May, but there were a couple things. One is I have an immense appreciation for what this work group did. Um, it's remarkable, it's effective service. It was huge. Um, and I think that if you think about what you've done here, please know that it was worth your time because we all started out trying to get on a path we're from where we were to a path that was um, managing beaver at the landscape level and looking at this as, as how to make some of those shifts to a landscape level as we try to figure out benefits from these animals. So I have immense appreciation for what you did. Um, the rest of it, um, as somebody just said, this launches a lot more work, it will. And I appreciate that you're willing to take an active role in an ongoing way. And I'll save the rest for May. So thank you all. Thank you, Chair Wall. All right, 12, 15, 12, 17. Thanks everybody for staying a little bit longer. It's been a pleasure to work with you. We'll be following up with some of you between now and uh, the end of the month.